Big mergers and big deals. As markets react to the latest deal making, will it be enough to wake sleepy markets and bring out the bulls this week? Workers unite in France, but what about us here in Switzerland? Ahead of Workers' Day on May 1st, we're asking why the striking culture of our neighbors hasn't spread here. Our guests tonight tell us about Switzerland's unique position. And the legendary Jackson 5 member on his love affair with Switzerland. Our newsmaker tonight is Jermaine Jackson, who talks to us about his music, on being a mentor, and how he first learned about Switzerland while at school in America. Growing up, going to elementary school and doing my history class, the teacher would pass out books and on different countries and stuff, and I would turn to the pages in, in Switzerland, and I would stare at the pages, and this was way before the Jackson 5 days, yeah. and I would just kind of put myself into that page, and, and um, I always said one day I would get a chance to go. Good evening, you're watching The Swiss Pulse. I am Ana Maria Montero, and welcome to The Living Markets. It's a packed day of news and interviews for you tonight, so let's get started. All right, as always, tonight we're going to get started looking at those headlines making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Swiss online retailer Sidup is closing its doors. Owner Co-op made the announcement in a report today. Sidup, which has also launched with Swisscom, will cease trading by the end of the year. According to a spokesperson, no layoffs are planned. The 180 Sidup employees will be offered roles at other Co-op entities. France's Accor Hotels will buy Movin Pick hotels and resorts for 560 million Swiss francs. Movin Pick is one of Switzerland's most well known brands in hotels and food. Its main markets today are in Europe and the Middle East, and the company plans to open 42 additional hotels by the year 2021. The deal is the latest step by Accor to diversify from budget hotels. Acor Hotel's shares are up by nearly 10% so far this year, outperforming a fall of around 5% on the Stocks Europe 600 Travel and Leisure Index. A closely watched leading indicator of the Swiss economy steadied in April after a bigger than anticipated decline in March. The cough economic barometer rose slightly, and although that indicator failed to reach the positive values seen at the start of the year, the current value was clearly above the long-term average. And in some Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May has named Saeed Yavid, a known Eurosceptic, as Home Secretary in an appointment that could tip the balance of power in the cabinet toward a harder Brexit. Yavid's predecessor, Amber Rudd, was a key pro-EU voice who often dealt a counterpoint to pro-Brexit hardliners. Yavid, a former banker, has been clear on his stance that the UK should leave the customs union, which is currently a high point of contention in Brexit negotiations. On Wednesday, he will attend a key meeting of the Brexit War Cabinet, which will look at what kind of future relationship the UK will see with EU after the split. The will they or won't they is over. Deutsches Telekom T-Mobile and Soft, SoftBank's Sprint have agreed to merge after years of negotiations. The combined company would take on T-Mobile's name, with T-Mobile CEO John Leger set to head the merged company. Sprint and T-Mobile first discussed the merger in 2014, but plans stalled because of concerns about regulatory challenges from the Obama administration. In the U.S., regulators in the Trump administration will have to sign off and the merger before it's final. And in a massive boost to the UK grocer Sainsbury's, plans to buy Walmart's Asda in a $10 billion deal. Sainsbury's stock surged to its highest level in 30 years. The combination of the two would create a supermarket power rivaling or even surpassing current market leader Tesco and could help it compete against Amazon. 
UK politicians, however, have called for an antitrust review, and there is still a significant risk that the deal will be blocked by regulators. And coming up, we look ahead at what's in store for the week. But first up, your weather forecast. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland, and south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back to The Living Markets. I'm Ana Maria Montero, and let's start with a, new, with a look at the news around the world. Now, it's only Monday, but it has already been a big week for deal-making. U.S. telco giant T-Mobile is buying up rival Sprint for 26 billion U.S. dollars. Just to give you an idea of the sheer size of this deal, they are the third and fourth largest U.S. wireless carriers, respectively. Now, the second deal that's causing chatter today, U.K. supermarket group Sainsbury's buying Walmart's Asda for 10 billion U.S. dollars. That's going to lead to the creation of Britain's biggest food retailer. So we can see most of these markets are up today. And zooming in on Asia, it's a new chapter for North and South Korea, following their first summit in more than a decade. And the meeting between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in seems to be paying off. Today, South Korea's Kospi index ending up almost a solid point in the green. Now, the real winners of this summit are construction firms, train, and steel manufacturers in Korea. That's because there are hopes now there will be increased railway and road projects between the two Koreas. Here's an example. Shares of train manufacturer Hyundai Rotom surge 30%, and that's its highest level in nearly four years. Now, big news in the hospitality industry today, and maybe even for your next holiday, so listen up. French hotel group Accor Hotels is snapping up Switzerland's Movenpoke hotels and resorts for 560 million Swiss francs. Now, investors seem to think the New Deal is the right step forward with shares of Accor up almost two points. And Movenpoke has 84 hotels under its wing and is currently based in Bar, Switzerland. Founder Willy Prager sold the company in 1991 to German investor von Fink. And it's his family now who is making a profit out of this deal. And to finish up here at home, the SMI wrapped up today, almost half a point in the green. And keep in mind that most markets in Europe will be closed tomorrow on May 1st or Labor Day. Now, it's an interesting week ahead, including the wait for U.S. President Donald Trump's decision on trade tariffs for Europe, as well as the announcement of the U.S. Federal Reserve's monetary policy. And joining me in the studio now is Norman Villeman. He's Chief Investment Officer of UBP. He's here to shed some light on both of these subjects, among other things, what this could mean for Swiss and global markets. Norman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank As you. always, great to see you. Thank you for having me. All right, so <laughs> let's just get at it. Trump, trade tariffs, possible announcement, well, expected announcement tomorrow. Um, you know, what do you think? Well, I think this is the announcement on what I'll call the first round of tariffs, so steel and, steel and aluminum, uh, that were announced uh, in early February. 
Um, we think the markets have adjusted to that. We saw the market sell off in uh, February, haven't rebounded very much. We think that's in the market. What is not in the market is an expansion of that tariff and the, that trade conflict that has been brewing. And we don't think that is necessarily a worry in the near term. Okay, so that's the markets. Now, what do you, what, so we're looking to see if Europe will still be exempt from tomorrow's announcement. We're looking to see if they'll still be exempt from the new export tariffs. Do you believe they will be? I expect they will be, uh, largely because if you look at the second round of the tariff conflict, it was clear it was very focused on China in terms of where the exemptions were and China as a direct target of uh, the, the moves by the United States. So I think we're going to see the next rounds to be very, very China-focused and really trying to reset that relationship between those two large countries. So you think that the Eurozone can breathe easy? I think they can breathe easy for now, but what does appear to be clear is that the United States would like to eff effectively reset the trade frameworks that have been in place since WTO and look for a new framework that perhaps, in their view, is a little less imbalanced uh, against them. All right, so that's, that's good news even for us here in Switzerland, no? In the, in the near in term, the near I think term. that's good news, but what it does do... Good news do, for Germany is good news for us here. <laughs> that's true. Um, but I think what it does do, it, it creates this, uh, this uh, small piece of uncertainty which Mark is going to have to price going forward. And uncertainty is never good for investors. No, that's right. What, what uncertainty were you referring to, what you said before about the markets? Or? Uh, the uncertainty going forward is what are the next steps? Again, I think we need to realize, for example, there's a new uh, government likely to take uh, uh, power in Mexico in July. Okay. Um, that will bring the NAFTA discussion back to the forefront uh, for North America. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, in November, uh, the uh, Republicans will have to defend their majorities in both the House and the Senate. And that will be an opportunity, if you like, for Donald Trump and the Republicans to push harder on this trade front um, and their America First policies. And that may create some instability as well. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, if we stay with stateside news, then we've got the Fed meeting coming up this week. Mm -hmm. And um, what could this possible trade tariff decision mean for the Fed? Well, look, I, th I think there is concern, and they've highlighted, the Fed has highlighted that if you get Im in, uh, imbalances on the trade front, uh, that could affect the growth outlook that the Fed is uh, looking at uh, in terms of how they're setting policy. But in the near term, we don't think there's any changes to that growth outlook. Growth in the first quarter actually came in above what a lot of people were worried about. They thought it was going to be closer down towards two. Inflation is coming up as expected. And so we think the Fed will stay on track um, and signal a rate hike in the June meeting uh, coming forward. Could there be? So we, there are three rate hikes expected, right, this year? We, we believe there's three more. So we had, obviously, the March move. We think they'll come in June, September, and then again in December. Okay, so we could look at, could we see four? Well, the market is increasingly pricing four, um, and we think that is probably about right. That gets us, from a real interest rate perspective, adjusting for inflation, mm -hmm. uh, real interest rates in the United States back to above zero for the first time really since the crisis. Um, and we think that's where the Fed would like to be. And if we look at last week, also the bond yields, yes. were the rates went up over 3%. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does this mean for monetary policy and what the Fed might be saying? I think the Fed is quite interested to see how these bond yields are going to affect the, uh, affect the growth story going forward in the U.S. Again, the first quarter growth was quite good. We expect growth in the subsequent quarters to stabilize here, not a lot more acceleration, mm -hmm. even though bond yields are at 3%. If that's the case, then I think the Fed will be comfortable that its policies are on the right track. Uh, if not, then bond yields probably come off from here. And the overall Fed meeting effects on the markets? Um, for us, we think as long as they're guiding towards continued rate hikes, again, in the June meeting mm -hmm. and in the second half of the year, that keeps the markets on track in terms of where expectations are mm -hmm. uh, from here. And as a result, I think the markets will then continue to focus on the earnings picture, which have been quite good. And you'll see uh, them trying to scrape back uh, from what had been a difficult first quarter of the year. Okay. Now, if we bring it back now to Europe, mm -hmm. um, in, Euro the Euro in the Eurozone in general, inflation is lower. Yes. So should we continue not to worry? 
Laura. Um, we should, if you like, we, we should still be comfortable in the Eurozone for a couple of reasons. One, at a much earlier stage of the recovery than, for example, the United States. Secondly, one of the reasons why inflation has been quite low is the Euro, and admittedly even the Swiss franc until fairly recently, had been quite strong. And again, uh, until recently, commodity prices had been relatively low. What we've seen over the last six weeks or so, the Euro, the Swiss franc, um, has have started to weaken. Mm. And on the flip side of that, commodity prices have started to rise. So you should start to see inflationary pressures building both in the Eurozone and in Switzerland over the coming quarters. And what would this, yeah. What, what about the gap between U.S. and the German Treasury yields? Now, these are bigger than they have been since the beginning of the century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so almost 19 years. Do you feel like this will pressure the ECB to make a decision faster? Well, I think if I'm the ECB, one of the things I'm disappointed in mm. is in spite of the gap, the euro has been quite strong. Um, and as a result, inflation is quite low. And so if they start to see uh, the euro weakening, they will probably be happy with that gap, meaning their policies are moving in the right direction from here. So I don't think they're all too uh, concerned about how wide that gap is, as long as it means that uh, their policy uh, initiatives are taking hold within the, the eurozone economy. Okay, and if we zoom in to Switzerland now, in Switzerland here we're caught between very positive growth because mm -hmm. it's above the, poten the, the potential, it's moving at a faster rate, and, but the SNB cannot really do much. Is this correct? They can't really do much uh, from the standpoint that obviously they're, they are constrained a little bit by what the ECB is going to do. Mm -hmm. um, but what they can do, and this is what we think they're doing, is we do think that they are willing to let the Swiss economy run a bit hot from here. Inflation remains below target. The Swiss economy is looking very good, but there aren't imbalances. There aren't uh, instability within the economy, uh, a hot property market, speculation moving through the economy, high amounts of leverage. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, given that even at 120 on the Euro-Swiss franc exchange mm -hmm. rate, we're right back where we started before they removed the floor. Yeah. I would probably expect yeah. them to allow the economy to run hotter, the Swiss franc to be a bit weaker, uh, to get them a bit closer to target. Now, Norman, you're unbelievably positive <laughs> about everything that I've asked you. Is there anything negative that could happen that could cast a shadow uh, in the short term? Well, uh, I, we, we are positive and we are constructive, but we do think 2018 is going to be a more challenging year than 2017, mainly because of where valuations are. Um, and why is that important today and it wasn't important last year? The main reason for that is, is we believe the accelerating growth that we've seen over the last 12 months is starting to peak out. And historically, when that's happened, valuation peaks out. And so we're going to lean more heavily on earnings, which, as we've seen, have been a bit, a bit more mixed um, in this earnings season. And what does this mean for, for investors? I think when we look for investors, again, last year was a year where, for the most part, you just waited and the market went up. This year, it's going to be much more challenging. You're going to see this kind of volatility, and you're going to have to pick your spots. We think active management, active investors are going to be much more rewarded this year than last year, where a passive strategy uh, was an adequate way to participate in the markets. All right. Well, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, Norman, for being with us, as always. And much more here on The Living Markets. But first, we're going to have a look at that Forex by Swissco. been a tough year so far for pension funds, with the first quarter of the year proving to be a particularly challenging one for the markets. Earlier, Hannah Wei spoke to Markus Stierli, head of pension solutions at Credit Suisse, who says that he isn't too concerned, since the past few years have been exceptionally positive for pension funds. I think that's, that's something that's happening everywhere in Europe, across Europe. 
Uh, I think so one, one thing that's now interesting is that most pension funds had to uh, gain bigger exposure to equity markets, which have suffered a bit. But uh, this, you know, this year uh, is going to run for another couple of months, so we'll see how that pays out in the end. But what about the, the Swiss pension market itself? Because it isn't the same everywhere in, uh, across the world. I mean, here, mm -hmm. a lot of people put into their third pillar, don't they? I mean, mm -hmm. are people interested in saving for the future? I think they are, and I think we're lucky. We have an exceptional uh, pension system based on the three pillars. The third pillar is the one that you just mentioned, which might get a bit, little bit more um, prominence right now. I think one thing that's now common across all countries in Europe is that the pension system have come under pressure. And in Switzerland, this is now, of course, a big topic, particularly since last year, when we saw uh, the popular vote being rejected in September. So uh, there has to be reform in the system uh, to sustain our pension system. That's now very obvious. And uh, of course, the two major concerns are aging societies, which is not a volatile issue. This is something that happens gradually. And then the market, on the other hand, uh, given that there's a low interest rate in environment, which is the other challenge. Another how can, thing... How concerned are you about the future of pensions? I have to say I'm... I'm Modestly concerned, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that this is, has to do a bit more with, with the Swiss political system uh, that has just proven over, over decades, really, that it's very difficult to push through reforms. Mm -hmm. And there is, I think everyone acknowledges that there has to be reform. So uh, aging societies imply that at one point either uh, you have to raise uh, the retirement age or uh, the benefits are going to be lower, and uh, the second is something that we try to avoid. How do you see pensions changing in the coming years? I mean, obviously very slowly given mm -hmm. the political challenges, but what needs to be done to make sure people are provided for in the future? I think one thing that, that becomes very clear now is that particularly in the state pensions, first pillar, um, it's now clear that we've, uh, we've sustained this for a long time, but we're, not, we're now running out of resources. And I think the government made this very clear. So there has to be a reform. And uh, this has been, uh, I'd say, a pretty significant political debate, also public debate. And people are now more concerned. And we have at Credit Suisse, we have our own worry parameter. And we see that that's now the first major concerns that uh, people in Switzerland have, which is rather unique. Are you seeing then people taking action into their own hands? I would expect that to happen. It's a bit early to interpret the data, but this is definitely something but that should happen. But they can only happen. take it into their hands to a certain level, can't they? I mean, yeah. I mean, aside from just general savings. Yeah, first of all, there's the overall, um, I think, notion that it's getting more difficult. Mm. And then there's also pension funds are starting to react, particularly on the conversion rate. So lifetime annuities are getting smaller, and this is something that you have to complement with your private savings. And we expect that uh, to, to gain more prominence right now. So people will take that in, into their own hands. So you've got the third pillar where people are kind of pushing as much as they can if they are concerned about the future. But what about you? How are you maximizing profits? Uh, I think, first of all, it's in the, in the hands of the individual. In also, the third pillar is subject to uh, the pension provisions which you have in Switzerland. So you can invest modestly, you cannot take too much risk, mm -hmm. you cannot take excessive risk. And uh, the other thing which is, is noteworthy is, of course, there is a cap on how much you can invest in the third pillar, which is close to 6,800 francs a year. So that puts a natural limit on what you can do. But um, when people are investing, when, when banks are in investing in pensions uh, and they're trying to make as much money as possible mm -hmm. um, for the pension pots, I mean, what kind of investments are you looking at? Last week we were talking about sustainable investments. On mm -hmm. one hand, they kind of buck the trend to the stock market and mm -hmm. can, in the long term, uh, be a profitable avenue to go down. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, in, the state, in, in the second pillar, in the occupational mm -hmm. pension plans, uh, that's a responsibility of the board of trustees of every pension funds, and they start to look into different alternatives to invest. Of course, first of all, you know, most importantly, because bond markets are just where they are right now. And uh, there's uh, different alternatives, and, and one is one that you just mentioned, sustainable investments is, is, of course, a big topic in Switzerland. But it's not only, uh, I, I think it's not only a return-driven momentum, it's also um, the beneficiaries of the pension funds having a say on, on what their pension fund manager, their asset managers, are supposed to do with their money because ultimately 
it's the beneficiaries that own the pension fund as a group. And of course, doing it in a cost-effective way mm -hmm. is very important as well. That's why a lot of uh, people are investing in ETFs, exchange-traded funds. Mm -hmm. Is that something? That's something that, that's, uh, of course, uh, if you look at the retirement system, um, of course, the administrative cost and also the cost of investment management uh, take a burden. But of mm. course, that's something that we perceive as natural because someone has to invest the money. But the trend in investment fees is, is going uh, in, in one direction. And the trend towards ETF, ETFs is, is, is definitely a clear case in that direction. Any other ways that you would see investments going in the future? It's actually interesting to see that real estate is still for pension fund is a very is still a preferred asset class. Mm. So if you compare it to what, what you have in, in a typical private asset allocation, so pension funds have a lot of means to invest because they have large volumes to invest and uh, they take appropriate measures to make sure that their investment returns are, are still, are still um, good and at the benefit of their, of their beneficiaries. And just looking uh, finally at interest rates, I mean, we've had negative interest mm. rates for a very long time. This has been bad news for, for pension holders and savers alike. And just looking down that very long mm. tunnel, ca can you see a glimmer of light away down there or the beginnings of a glimmer of light that well, we'll it's... start to see interest rates going up in the next years? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I can't really comment on the interest rates themselves, but what's interesting is also that the interest rate that you get as a pensioner uh, at the time of retirement is also going down. And a lot of people think that that's a problem. Uh, but you also have to acknowledge that inflation is very low, so that might compensate a little. Um, but it is, it is one of the, of the major challenges that uh, pension funds face, and they've been moving their asset allocations towards more riskier assets. And this is something that needs to, to sustain itself uh, over a longer period of time. Okay, Marcus Steerley, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. All right, switching gears to sports news now. Earlier, Hannah Wise caught up with Matt Layton to discuss maps, compasses, and a sport that Switzerland is very, very good at. All right, Matt, orienteering was something I used to do when I was at school, but I understand there's even a European championships. And it's a big event. It's going to be taking place in Ticino from the weekend, so the 5th, over the next six or seven days. And it's going to be really dynamic. It's the creme de la creme of Europe taking part. As we know, different distances. So you have the sprint, which is about 12 minutes. The medium, which takes about half an hour. And the long distance, which takes about 90 minutes. As you can see, well, what it is in orienteering. Lots of different versions. There's urban through the city. There's forest over the mountains. There's bicycle. There's all sorts of things. Essentially, you have to go on a planned route using a map, very detailed map, and a compass, stamping your to a little card in certain places. So the skill is to have an idea of where you're going, be very athletic, and to be able to navigate over often unknown and difficult terrain. That's what orienteering is, and it's very, very popular. And I imagine it's come a long way since I did it way back when, because it, for me, it was all about running through the rain, soggy maps, but I imagine technologically, it's a little bit more advanced these days. Yes and no. For the actual athletes, no. So they still have to go using a map and a compass. However, as opposed to doing a little hole stamp, which you and your pals at school probably did, now it's all done electrically. So that's different. However, the spectator experience, that's completely changed. They have a huge screen now, and they can actually follow the athletes by GPS. So it's one of those sports that they're trying as much as possible to keep it pure and basic and keep it to the core skills, which is detailed map reading, navigation, endurance. And seeing as this is being held in Ticino, I'm imagining we're pretty good at this, Switzerland. I'd say better than pretty good, possibly the best nation in the world. There's in the men's, for example, you have Matthias Geibas and Daniel Hoopman. They're number one and three in the world. Matthias, 
four-time world champion. There's, there's Matt, he's in the middle. On the right of your screen is Daniel. He's a seven-time world champion. And these guys have been at the top for the last seven or eight years. Also, in the women, there's a huge depth of field as well. So it's one of those sports that Switzerland, for some reason, well, there's about 10,000 people take part in, in this in Switzerland. It is mainly a sport which is popular in Ticino and the Swiss-German part. But again, uh, in Geneva and around there, they do have uh, uh, sort of Fairly, very good standards. But yes, Switzerland, for some reason, I was asking the National uh, Secretary General, Martin Gagax, I said, why is Swiss so good? And he couldn't come up with an answer. I suppose it's a passion sport. There is a little bit of money in it if you are at the right at the top level, mainly through sponsorships. But yes, I don't, no one knows why, but the Swiss are extremely good and maybe the best team in the world. And tell me how this sport is developing in the future as well. You mentioned there's different kinds of orienteering. Yes, well, the International Organ uh, Orienteering Federation, they're traitors. Well, not really, but they're one of the few federations that are actually not based in Switzerland. They're actually based in Sweden. So come and join us, please. But yes, they're actually looking at the foot start. They're looking at the urban, as you can see in your picture. The urban, it's going to be their world championships in Denmark in 2020. What they're choosing there is they're going through, as the name suggests, town atmospheres, it's sprint but they're actually choosing old cities, so there's lots of intricate little roads there. There's also canoe, there's bicycle, there's ski, and there's lots of different ways you can actually go forward. So the main, I suppose, change in the future is they're trying to make it more popular with the masses. I suppose, like Biathlon did a few years ago, they've taken it out of going into the country and bring it more street cred. So yes, this urban is actually going to be a real, real, uh, I suppose, a breakthrough event when it actually, it's probably going to split in some way from the actual classic forest people. Because at the moment, a lot of the champions, the champions in the middle and the long and the short discipline, I think what we're going to see, according to the experts, in the next few years, is people are going to specialize. They're actually trying to go into the Olympics as well. Are they making success? Well, not yet. There's about 80 federations that get involved. However, they actually tried to get, they tried to get the bidding process for the, uh, the Tokyo Games. They tried to get as a reserve, as a demonstration sport for the, uh, the Paris Games. Not quite yet yet, but they do feel that in the future generations, they might make it to the Olympic Games, in the World Games at the moment. So we're big fans of orienteering. It's a clean sport. It's an outdoor sport. It's a popular sport. And it doesn't cost much money. So let's go orienteering, orienteering Switzerland, the best nation in the world. All right. Uh, Matt Leeson, thank you very much indeed, as always. Searching for the key to creativity, scientists are peering inside the brains of jazz musicians and other improvisational artists. So could jazz improv be the key to creativity? More on that in the CNN Health Minute. There's only one constant in jazz. It's always changing. As jazz musicians play, their brains create the ultimate freestyle improv. That's why science is peering inside, searching for the neural basis of our creativity. You see, jazz musicians spontaneously riff off each other, making it up as they go. What happens in their brains while they improv? Well, science is now using functional MRIs to find out. Neuroscientist Dr. Charles Lim found jazz players get into the flow by ramping up the part of the brain shown in yellow that allows humans to express themselves, while shutting down the area shown in blue that monitors and inhibits us. Recent research finds musicians who are mentally flexible and divergent, and who devote thousands of hours to practice, may access their creative flow more quickly. And it's not just all that jazz. Scientists are exploring the creative neural pathways in the brains of freestyle rap artists, classical musicians, comedians, caricature artists, while looking closely at the role of collaboration and emotion. Want to tap into your creative juices? Well, find something you enjoy and practice it without judgment. Then try to let go and feel the flow. All right, stay with us. After the break, we're going to meet the CEO of Fashwell, Fashwell, a Swiss startup company that is heading to Silicon Valley. Stay tuned. In tonight's Tech Talk, we start a series on Swiss startups that went to Silicon Valley earlier this year with the help of Venture Lab. 
a national startup training program. This week, we start with image recognition company Fashwell. Martina Fuchs interviewed its CEO, Matias D'Antone, just before he flew to the U.S. The Zurich-based startup Fashwell is the winner of several Kickstarter campaigns and startup challenges. It began as an app that automatically recognizes fashion products in images, made possible by an algorithm for image analysis based on machine learning. It was among the handful few to be selected to go to Silicon Valley this March for the Venture Leaders Technology 2018 Summit and participate in an international investor roadshow. To talk about this, I'm now joined here in the studio by CEO and co-founder Matthias D'Antone. Matthias, first of all, tell me a little bit how this technology exactly works. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> what we're doing is relatively simple. So we try to teach the algorithm to see, we try to teach the computers to see, and, um, and especially um, not seeing in general, but really recognizing products. And um, the algorithm, uh, we have to train the algorithm really similar to a kid. We show it, for example, in, in this example of fashion, we show the algorithm several handbags in the color blue, several handbags in the color red, and just by reputation, it, it continuously learned to identify what are specific features of, an, of a handbag, and then um, the algorithm can apply this gained knowledge to like a new image, an unseen image. So in real life, how fast and accurate is this image recognition and analysis? Yeah. <clears throat> it's actually quite fast. Um, we, we got integrated into several consumer apps. Um, for example, we're powering the Zalando app, and with the Zalando app, you can take a picture of a handbag you like, and, and then in real time, in less than a second, you get a response, and then you can immediately buy that, um, that product. And accuracy is a little bit different. We have to do two different steps. In the first step, we have to localize the product in the image. So we have to say, in this list coordinate, there was a handbag. Um, that usually is extremely fast, is extremely um, accurate. We have accuracy about 94% on that one. And then it's the recognition. For example, if it's um, a, a pretty unique and iconic shoe, a handbag, then we're pretty sure that we recognize that one. Um, but if you take a picture of an arbitrary blue jeans, then we obviously respond with similar looking blue jeans in the same style. Now you started as an app and mm -hmm. then, as you mentioned, were integrated into Zalando. Uh, and now since 2017, you're also a uh, B2B business, basically. Uh, how do you function and who are your customers? Yeah. <clears throat> we were extremely lucky to have Zalando as one of our first clients. But the technology we have is, um, is really generic and can be used uh, by anyone out there who needs image analysis with product information. Um, our typical clients are brands and retailers from the fashion industry. Um, so they're using us. And the other side, we are also working together with some of the biggest fashion magazines. Um, so we help them to make editorial content shoppable and so in order that they can actually make some money using, uh, using the pictures they're putting online. Now, you were selected among a couple of uh, startup companies here in Switzerland uh, by Venture Lab to go to the Silicon Valley to participate in the Ventures um, Technology Summit 2018 and also a roadshow with international investors. What uh, are you hoping to achieve from that trip? Um, <clears throat> obviously, Silicon Valley is really special and I'm really glad that we got selected. Uh, it's a big honor for us. Um, and Silicon Valley, it's so unique. We're spending a lot of time there. It's so unique, there's like almost like no limitation there. And um, for us, it's important because since we are like expanding to the US, it's important for us to like meet clients. Um, but we are still a small Swiss-based company with big visions. Um, our vision is to replace the keyboard with the camera. And um, in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of people who are sharing our mission and sharing our vision. And um, the plan is really to meet all of them and uh, make the next step towards our goal of replacing the keyboard with the camera. You have mentioned a golden word, uh, which is expansion in the United States. Tell me about your international expansion mm. plans. Yeah, we actually uh, recently expanded. We recently opened up an office in, um, in, in, so in New York City. Uh, first of March or second of March, we uh, opened up the office. Uh, we have at the moment one person there, but we're trying to 
um, expand a little bit there as well and uh, hire some people over there as well. So the fundraising environment uh, and also, you know, the funding in general for startups in Switzerland, I guess, is not very easy. How do you, you know, raise funds and uh, in which round are you already? Yeah. <clears throat> I think fundraising in Switzerland, you have to, first of all, divide biotech and IT. So I don't know anything about biotech, so just focus on IT. Um, and I think especially the angel round, so this friends and family um, um, it's relatively simple, actually, in Switzerland, especially if you come from ETH. ETH is helping a lot. A lot of wealthy uh, business angels here, and then you actually get that money. Uh, relatively simple, sometimes even too simple. Um, but then when it comes to like a decent seed round, uh, it becomes much, much harder for a Swiss company to raise since we don't have so many venture capitalists here. And then obviously continuing from seed round to series A round and series B round, it becomes harder and harder until you reach to the level where you're um, just an international company and then you raise the international anyway. And in uh, which round are you right now and how much capital are you <laughs> hoping uh, to raise at the As moment? A, so for us, we would say we're like in scaling uh, round. So we have now um, the first really big clients who are making uh, decent revenue and now it's really expansion. We proven that um, fashion is a really good market for us and now it's really expansion towards other verticals. We are already doing home and living now, but also then food and other um, verticals are interesting for us. Um, yeah, and obviously that costs, uh, expansion is expensive, so we're And to which again. extent has the team up with uh, the online uh, fashion and e-commerce company Salando helped your business? Um, it was really important for us at the beginning, um, especially um, with three co-founders and in the industry, everyone was laughing a bit since what do these three geeks and the nerds know about fashion? And so it gave us a lot of reputation, um, but then really teaming up with them as a, um, as a client um, and also getting other big retailers, European retailers as first clients was really good for us. So we learned a lot from them. Um, and so we yeah, gained a lot of knowledge in the fashion space. Um, and we now really working together with them to bring this research to everyone's pocket. And as you are now expanding beyond the Swiss borders uh, to the United States as well, do you have any other partnerships uh, in the pipeline? Um, yeah, obviously, we, so we are working together with um, some of the biggest retailers in Europe. I would say we are already making about 40% of our revenue in the US. So we already have international clients. Um, so this is, the US is really important for us. And, at the beginning, since e-commerce is global and images don't have any don't have any language, so we are by default an international company. So. Now you, Matthias, have your PhD in image recognition and analysis, and you also worked at Google and uh, BMW, for example. How much has this international experience and you know work with multinationals helped you in launching this startup? I think that we took a lot of best practice from Google. Um, Google is well known as being one of the companies that put a lot of focus on, on engineering and engineering culture. And I think we took a lot of engineering practices from Google and adapted it to, for, for the startup world. Um, as an example, the way we are structuring our weeks and the way we're structuring our quarters is copied one by one from Google and we're just adapting it to and to the startup board. And I think that was extremely important for us to get a little bit more professional uh, on the engineering side. I'm always very interested in the incentive, you know, for someone to give up a career at, uh, you know, the likes of Google, for example, and launch your own startup. Was, what was your main motivation? Um, it's, that's actually an interesting question because um, on one side it was, um, I also see startups as a big career opportunity. And I think everyone now, especially also with all this um, hyper on startups, everyone knows that uh, startups can also be a huge career opportunity. Um, but in the end, I was also really driven by a personal goal. Um, I'm collecting sneakers um, and I was like looking at sneakers online and didn't know how to describe them in words. And so um, I just, also solving one of my one of my passion problems, which is like finding awesome sneakers online, and that's where the fashion technology can actually help us. 
So let's take an everyday example. When you walk around the city of Zurich, do you have your mobile phone there and just, you know, scan people's mm. clothes and, and, and shoes? Mm. Or how do you walk around the city here? Switzerland is not such a fashionable city, <laughs> I must say. And uh, no, but um, I get inspired on, on social media. I get inspired online. And what I usually do is then I just quickly take a screenshot or something or use the picture I saw online and use that picture as a search query. And so in order to quickly step into the search results and really finding the shoe I was lacking. You just said that Switzerland is not a real big fashion market and scene. We have Mood Swiss, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the association that is trying to change that. How do you see the future of the fashion retail market here in Switzerland? <clears throat> fashion retail in Switzerland is, I would say, quite particular. Um, obviously, Switzerland has obviously the protectionism they have. It's um, yeah, it, it changed a bit. But we saw that we have Zalando as one of the, definitely the most dominant player here. And then we have Amazon trying to come into Switzerland or doing the first moves into Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> but in the fashion space, we don't have a big, purely online player in Switzerland. Right? So we have the big brick and mortar stores um, that are still focusing a lot on offline and not really putting a lot of effort into online. Um, and I think that's also going to be an interesting time for the future. So what does Picard said, Globus and, and Co. do in the online space? And they still haven't really committed to, um, to the online space, but I hope that Freshware can, can help some of them to really become a dominant player in the online space as well. With Amazon planning to enter the uh, Swiss market as well, I'm sure you must be talking uh, to them as well to maybe team up uh, with a partnership. <clears throat> We're talking to everyone. So we, our goal is really to change the way people are looking and searching for fashion products. And um, everywhere where people search, everywhere where people buy fashion products, they are perfect clients for us. So um, obviously we're talking to everyone who has an open ear. Sky is the limit. Now, you were also the winner of the uh, Swiss Startup Challenge, for mm -hmm. example, in 2016. How do these you know, competitions for startups actually help you to find a platform and a footing to kick off your career? <clears throat> I think it's important uh, for multiple reasons. One reason is this, this challenge is they bring the startup community closer together. Um, for example, in this, uh, we have been to San Francisco as well with 10 other founders. And um, out of these founders, we have now like really good, some of them became really good friends and they help, we're helping each other. And on the other side, I think it also brings a lot of awareness to the Swiss ecosystem for startups. And that's, there's a lot of um, benefits for everyone, especially for hiring. Now for um, good students from ETH, uh, the banks um, are not the only career opportunity they have. Now they're also seeing that some of the startups actually could be a potential career opportunity for them. And we're taking that also as, as a really good hiring instrument for us. So at the moment, uh, your headquarter is here in uh, Zurich, in uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Do you actually headhunt at the ETH and EPFL as well? Or how do you expand your office? Because at the moment, you just have about 16 people working for you here. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah for us, it's not. It's not, not only 16. So it's, for us, it's definitely um, quality over quantity. And we're spending a lot of time in hiring. We're pretty much participating in every hiring event they have at ETH or outside EPFL. So starting from startup speed dating, which is extremely helpful for us. And um, yes, we do hire um, at, um, at ETH, but also Switzerland is a pretty interesting um, spot for everyone to come here, and we also hiring international. Mm, we have 16 or 15, 15 employees at the moment, and as far as I can remember, we have like 10 nationalities. So we're hiring pretty much international. How do you see the startup, uh, you know, scene and community here in Switzerland? Uh, is it very difficult to, for example, lure Swiss people to join a startup because maybe in the conservative sense, you know, they still want to have a very stable job, work at a bank. Uh, that's why you have more international employees. <clears throat> that could be like one one thing, but um, I think also if you look at ETH, for example, they're doing their masters, there are a lot of international students, and I think. Um, this is just normally. So what we're looking for is students or you could be a young professional who really see the value of what we are bringing and see the value of working in a small startup and really trying 
um, <clears throat> yeah, we're looking for people who are really joining us into this, yeah, into the big set of path that we have, and we want to change the way people are searching for products. Before we go, in just one sentence, Matthias, if you have one, you know, dream, one wish, what would it be for your uh, startup company, Fashwell? Yeah, for us, <clears throat> we're in a mission to really be able to recognize every product um, in the world. And we're living in an extremely visual world, but if it's online or offline, and for us, it's really, we want to make yeah, every product shoppable and every product viable, and really want to help our clients to make the best visual experience uh, and bring that to everyone's pocket. And that's it from us here on The Living Markets this evening. Stay with us for the big picture with Hannah Wise coming up. Tonight, it's all about Labor Day and the state of labor relations in Switzerland. I'm Ana Maria Montero. I'm back in an hour with the newsmaker. Don't go away. Workers unite in France, but what about us here in Switzerland? Ahead of Workers' Day on May the 1st, we're asking why the striking culture of our neighbours hasn't spread here. Our guests tonight tell us about Switzerland's unique position. Also on the programme, the legendary Jackson 5 member on his love affair with Switzerland. Our newsmaker tonight is Jermaine Jackson, who talks to us about his music, on being a mentor, and how he first learned about Switzerland while at school in America. Growing up, going to elementary school and doing my history class, the teacher would pass out books and on different countries and stuff, and I would turn to the pages in, in Switzerland, and I would stare at the pages, and this was way before the Jackson 5 days, mm -hmm. and I would just kind of put myself into that page, and, and um, I always said one day I would get a chance to go a very warm welcome. You are watching the Big Picture Hour. I'm Hannah Wise. Let's get started. Monday the 30th of April. Welcome to the big picture. Let's start with a roundup of the main news headlines. Swiss online retailer Syrup is closing its doors. Owner Co-op made the announcement in a report out today. Syrup, which was launched with Swisscom, will cease trading by the end of the year. According to a spokesperson, no layoffs are planned. The 180 Syrup employees will be offered roles at other co-op entities. France's Accor Hotels will buy Movenpick Hotels and Resorts for 560 million Swiss francs. Movenpick is one of Switzerland's most well-known brands in hotels and food. Its main markets today are in Europe and the Middle East, and the company is planning to open 42 additional hotels by the year 2021. Now, the deal is the latest step by Accor to diversify from budget hotels. Accor Hotels shares are up by nearly 10% so far this year, outperforming a fall of around 5% on the stock's Europe 600 Travel and Leisure Index. A closely watched leading indicator of the Swiss economy steadied in April after a bigger than anticipated decline back in March. The COF economic barometer rose slightly and... Although that indicator failed to reach the positive value seen at the start of this year, the current value was clearly above the long-term average. In some Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May has named Sajid Javid, a known Eurosceptic, as Home Secretary in an appointment that could tip the balance of power in the Cabinet toward a harder Brexit. Javid's predecessor, Amber Rudd, was a key pro-EU voice who often dealt a counterpoint to pro-Brexit hardliners. 
David, a former banker, has been clear on his stance that the UK should leave the customs union, which is currently a high point of contention in Brexit negotiations. On Wednesday, he'll attend a key meeting of the Brexit War Cabinet, which will look at what kind of future relationship the UK will see with the EU following the split. The will they or won't they is over. Deutsche Telekom's T-Mobile and SoftBank's Sprint have agreed to merge after years of negotiations. The combined company would take on T-Mobile's name, with T-Mobile CEO John Leger set to head the merged company. Sprint and T-Mobile first discussed this merger back in 2014, but plans stalled because of concerns about regulatory challenges from the Obama administration. In the United States, regulators in the Trump administration will still have to sign off on the merger before it's final. In a massive boost to the UK grocer, Sainsbury's plans to buy Walmart's Asda in a $10 billion deal. Sainsbury's stock surged to its highest level in 30 years on the news. The combination of the two would create a supermarket power rivaling or even surpassing current market leader Tesco that could help it compete against Amazon. UK politicians, however, have called for an antitrust review and there is still a significant risk that the deal will be blocked by regulators. All right, we're getting ready to bring you tonight's big picture. It's all about labour relations here in Switzerland. That's ahead of Workers' Day tomorrow. We'll have a live and lively discussion after the break. CNN Money Switzerland Business Weather, starting with Europe. Next step, Africa and the Middle East. Southeast Asia. And now Australia and Oceania. Let's go to North America. We end our trip with off America. CNN Money Switzerland accompanies you all over the world. Welcome back to the program. This is the big picture. Now, here's a question for you. Are you looking forward to May Day tomorrow? Well, for many of us, it's a nice day off, a time to spend with friends and family. But it's also a day when workers' unions take to the streets. It's not a sight we see often here in Switzerland, though. In neighbouring countries like France and Germany, strikes and protests are frequent. It's even happening right now with the French National Rail. So why are labour relations so smooth here in Switzerland? Well, to understand why, we have to travel back in time 100 years. 1918 was the last time there was a major general strike here in Switzerland. Over three days, 250,000 workers took to the streets throughout the entire country to ask for better working conditions. Well, that led then to 1937 and to what we call la paix du travail or Arbeitsfrieden. There's no real English term for this, but it's the idea of negotiation over striking. This consists of a convention signed between employers and workers' unions. Since then, the idea has been a cornerstone of the Swiss work ethos. On average, in the last decade, only one day per year per 1,000 employees was lost due to strikes. Only in Japan and Slovakia have less with zero. Now, in contrast, here we have some of the top listed countries. Canada, Denmark, and in first place, 
you guessed it, France. But striking, just worth remembering, is not forbidden here in Switzerland. It is, in fact, in the Swiss Constitution. Well, joining me now is Valentin Vogt, President of the Swiss Employers Association. Welcome to the programme. Thank you very much in, uh, for joining us. Uh, is this true? I mean, uh, wh wh why do you think everything is so smooth running in Switzerland? Is it as we perceive it to be? Yeah, it is. It is the development over about 106 years. 106 years ago, Switzerland was one of the poorest countries in Europe. We had uh, 10,000 of people that migrated to the United States, to other countries. And we have basically three factors who led to where we are today. It's the liberal labour market that we have, the open labour market. It's our education system with the apprenticeship programme. And it's the social partnership. It's these three pillars basically are the key success factors from my view for Switzerland. Are we really that different, though, from our neighbours? Yeah, we are in that sense. I mean, we have a, a lot of our neighbours have, have a top-down system and we have a bottom-up system. You know, like we have these cantons which have a strong, a strong view and a strong voice here in Switzerland. And it's the same on the social partnership. The social partnership in Switzerland is not only all unionised, mm. it's how we treat our employees in each of our companies. This agreement, the 1937 agreement that we've been talking about, is it still relevant today? Yeah, it is. I mean, the idea is that we have basically, we say, it's agreement before law. So we find, you know, employees and employers find an agreement and basically agree that there is, that is not the, the lawmakers who then make the rules. It's, it's between partners on, 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 equal, on equal level. I wonder why then, you know, with countries such as France, who suffer a lot from uh, a lot of strikes, it brings the whole country to a standstill at, at yeah. times, why they don't look at Switzerland and take some uh, example from us? Because they have a complete different history. You know, France has always been a centralised mm. country where you have everything comes out of Paris, you can look at the roads, everything is at the end leading to Paris. And in Switzerland, it's, it's a bottom-up where the cantons have a strong view and basically Swiss people don't like, you know, institutions or, or people that have a lot of power. That's why we don't have a president. We have seven ministers and each year one of them is the, the, basically the chief minister yes. and is in charge of the country. And, and so that's, it, it's, and this has evolved over hundreds of years. I mean, basically you can go back to the medieval where we have been, you know, we have been independent since 1291. I wonder then, tomorrow is our day then, May Day. What are we trying to achieve then with these kind of workers' unions uh, events? Yeah, it's a, it's a tradition that the, the workers... Uh, is it more tradition over uh, action? I think, I mean, if you see what's happening, it's tradition. We had uh, uh, the last few years, unfortunately, not that the chaotic things that happened that has nothing mm. to do with the workers. It's other people who use that day to just protest and, uh, you know, destroy things and... Uh, I mean, that has basically stopped, especially here in Zurich, but it's, you know, it's, it's basically a peaceful event to remember that it's the, days, it's the, it's the workers' day. Yeah. Is it so much of a taboo, though, to even talk about striking? I, I, I want to understand the point at which strike action might come along, because, yeah. as we've said, it's, it's not that we never see it, we still see it sometimes, yeah. but at what point does that come? Yeah, I think it's, it's when, when one party believes that, that it has not been treated fairly. And in most of, the, of these uh, union contracts that we have, it says, you, you know, we, we, we sign an agreement, but we don't, people don't strike. So whatever, we can find then solutions on the negotiating table and not on the street, because at the end of the day, uh, this doesn't help anybody. I mean, we have seen strikes this year. Yeah, the yeah. Swiss news agency, for example, yeah. took action in January. Mm. It was short, but you know, it, it still happened. Um, why do you think it, it goes it, that got so far? As in general, the Swiss people are not people who look for you know look for dispute. I mean, mm. uh, they look basically. Uh, it's uh, in our psyche, our culture. Our psyche, we're more, <laughs> we're more lo looking for you know how can we find an agreement? But you know, there comes a point where. Uh, Maybe also these employees who felt that they were not treated fairly and they used this, this, uh, this strike, which at the end uh, we certainly uh, do not agree to do that, but uh, obviously it happened and uh, it's now they're back to the negotiating table and looking for solutions, the way I understand. Yeah. Do you think our economic prosperity is linked to these smooth labour relations? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the three key success mm. factors that we have uh, beside the liberal market, labour market, beside 
the dual track uh, education system with apprenticeships. It's a social partnership. About half of the people in Switzerland are under a unionized contract, and the other half is not under a unionized contract. But the social partnership there might be as strong as it's unionized because basically it's how the relation, the basis of all this is how our employers treat their employees. Mm. And this can happen with a contract or not with, or without a, a unionized contract. That's a, and that's a, a special way we do this here in Switzerland. And, and some would argue, though, that the conditions in Switzerland are more favorable to employers rather than employees. Does that also have an impact on how things are dealt with? Yeah, they do, because basically, you know, when there's a business opportunity in Switzerland, employers hire people. Because they know, you know, if things don't work out and, and no, no employer really likes to, to uh, let go people in that respect, but if it has to happen, it happens. So if there's an opportunity, people hire people, and, and that is also part of the prosperity. Mm. And in other countries, people, companies just don't hire people because they know they will never be able to, 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 uh, to license these people. And following on from that, then, yeah. obviously, Switzerland is a great place for people to do business because of those favourable labour relations. Do we attract uh, overseas yeah. business here because of that as well? Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies that uh, select uh, Switzerland, for example, as their European headquarters. And one mm. of these factors is that we have uh, basically... Uh, so it's not just down to tax, like everybody would say? No, 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 no. I think we have, uh, you know, we have a great, a great uh, uh, atmosphere for living. Mm. That's certainly part of it. But I think the social partnership is important. And as you showed on your graph, I mean, you know, with one, one strike day uh, compared to France with 123, that makes a difference, yeah. yeah. And I guess from a consumer point of view as well, when, I, I mean, as if I was travelling from Zurich to Paris, yeah. for yeah. example, I may choose yeah. Swiss yeah. as yeah. an airline over Air France because Absolutely. Swiss is going to be more reliable. I mean, does that yeah. affect business from that angle as well, not just from employers? But from, from consumers Absolutely, as and, well. and we have also on our, I think, on our uh, public uh, public sector, for example, public transport. I mean, this is this is not nobody can mm. think of that that they would start striking because that's basically not something you know. And you have millions of people that uh, are not able to get to work because uh, maybe you know ten thousand people are unhappy with their work conditions, and that's we don't have the culture of that. So, what are the challenges then facing um, employers' union here? In, yeah, in I mean, uh, basically, I think we, we are developing this further. I mean, there's, for the unions, the problem is that a lot of new jobs that are now created are traditionally not unionized mm. because there is new, uh, you know, in the IT sector or in the telecom sector uh, where completely new jobs come. And basically, the, the number of people that are organized in the, on, under unions is decreasing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's part of, the, part of the problem of the unions, that uh, they lose kind of, of, of uh, influence. And from your point of view, do you see employers still interested in having sure. your association to back them? Yeah. For example, you know what's happening in my company in Winterthur. We have employed about 700 people in Winterthur. And we, are, we have a, a work council there that is selected by the employees. When we have a, an issue, we talk to them and they tell us basically what they think about it because we can't talk to 700 people. And, and that happens in most of the companies, that they have uh, people uh, that, are, that are representing the employees in the company. And that's, that's basically, that's where the social partnership happens. Our part of our uh, social partnership, which is also important, is the, the pension system. We have a, a three-pillar pension system mm -hmm. and the second pillar is basically something that's, that's between the employees and the employers, which is uh, our, our uh, mm. savings plans that we have, and that is also an important part of it. And just very, very quickly, will you be doing anything tomorrow? Working. <laughs> <laughs> On Workers' Day. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Okay, thank you. All right, after the break, we'll be speaking to a board member of the trade union, Unia, who says that despite a lack of protest, there are still many challenges ahead for workers' unions. Stay with us for that. Welcome back to The Big Picture. Tonight, ahead of May Day tomorrow, 
It's all about labour relations here in Switzerland. Earlier, we spoke to the Employers Association. Now we're going to hear from Corinne Scherer, Executive Board Member at Workers' Union, UNIA. I began by playing devil's advocate and I asked her why unions exist at all if strike action is not so common here in Switzerland. Well, <laughs> it's always, uh, it's not the case that all people are happy at work. There are, of course, um, situations that are difficult for people. I mean, we all know there are also um, dismissals. Um, there are people who um, get ill because there's a lot of pressure at work nowadays. Are these typically people are some stressed. of the issues um, that you're dealing with? Oh, yes. At the moment, we deal um, a lot with issues like um, stress, pressure at the workplace, also an increase of precarious working conditions, particularly also for women. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to deal, to deal with dismissals, as I said, um, companies that move part of their companies to Asia or Eastern Europe. Um, so we're dealing every day with issues like this. So it's not that workers, all workers are always happy in Switzerland. That's a myth. But unions are facing a shrinking membership. Uh, not UNIA, no. We have actually, uh, we have an increase of membership, mm -hmm. UNIA, since UNIA was founded. It was a fusion of two two unions. Um, and since then, for more than 10 years, we have an increase in our membership. Um, there have been um, you, there's, there's been a decrease of membership with certain unions, mm -hmm. but all unions now in Switzerland actually could stabilise and their is membership. That, is that just kind of so, reflecting uh, the, the, the jobs of the future and the kind of roles that people are playing in the future? Oh, I think um, it's actually reflective of that people realise that it's important um, realize again that it's very important to uh, join a union and to be sure that if they are in trouble um, that they have help. And also because more and more people understand that it's important to um, also take action if necessary, mm -hmm. collectively, together with other people so that you're stronger and that you can change things at the workplace. And it's very visible when you go to France. I used to live there myself, and striking was uh, very much part of life there. But it, it really doesn't seem that way here in Switzerland. I mean, is there this belief that strike action and taking action like that so publicly is kind of frowned upon? Or um, there, is not, there is different history to strikes in Switzerland. Mm. But it's not true that there are no strikes. Also, that is a myth. It's true that um, after the Second World War, there were um, very, very few strikes. There was a period of um, building up the country. There was quite a lot of wealth to be distributed in negotiations between employers' associations and unions. But since the turn of the millennium, there have been more and more strikes. Actually, um, over 100 strikes that... Uh, UNIA, our union, was involved in and has supported workers in strikes. They're maybe compared to France or England or Germany, well, maybe even Germany, yes. Um, not so long. They're maybe mm. sometimes they're only a day, sometimes they're three days. Uh, can also be up to 10 days, maybe um, two weeks. Are we going and to the, see more of them then? And the di I think the difference is, what you're talking about, the difference is not that there are no strikes, there are strikes, but maybe the difference is that um, in Switzerland, the tradition is that you enter into negotiations rather quickly. There is a long tradition of negotiate, negotiating between employers, and employers' associations and unions or workers' representatives at, at companies. And that's got to do with our long tradition of big collective agreements. Mm, I was going to ask about the political mm. influence here because, you know, the Swiss take a lot of decisions uh, collectively. For example, 
They said no to an extra week of holiday. They said no to higher salaries. They say no to paternity leave, oh, for yes, example. Oh, yes, these were referendums. So does this, yes, do these yeah. kind of, does that political system take away some of the decisions that you perhaps would be more involved in if you were in a different political situation? Mm, no, I think it's just complement. It's, it's actually complementary. You know, there is, a, as I said, there's a tradition which is really important and decisive between... Um, unions and employers associations to settle a lot of questions by negotiating and by collective agreements. And is that situation and unique? Actually, actually, actually um, com is complementary to our law. Um, our labour law is actually rather weak. Um, on, who's, on the side of the employees or the employers? Oh, on the <laughs> side, on, yes, on the side of the em employees. It doesn't mm. give much protection to workers. Should labour laws be Whereas changed? Whereas with the collective agreements, we can actually increase this protection um, a lot. And also what's interesting in Switzerland, um, which is different to other countries, we could actually increase the number of collective agreements in the recent years. So this system becomes stronger. Mm. That's why also the unions are very important and have more support by the workers because what we do in these and, and um, actually succeed in doing by these collective agreements is seen by workers as very important and helpful. And so it's not so much to do with the political system as such, but more to do with the long tradition of negotiating and collective agreements. Tomorrow is May the 1st, Workers' Day. What are you doing to mark this? Um, I'm going to Rheinfelden, which is uh, near Basel. I'm going to join the rally there and I'm going to speak, of course, on behalf of the of UNIA and the workers. And I'm going to talk in particular about equal pay for equal work. Mm. That's an issue that in Switzerland is not resolved, as in many other countries. Uh, women don't earn the same amount of money for, this, um, <clears throat> for the equal mm -hmm. work as men. Um, that's one issue. And the other issue is that it is necessary to improve our labour law because, as I said, protection is not enough and that we've got to um, improve our collective agreements and give young people um, a lot more chances in professional life. Corinne Shira, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. All right, sports news now and a little earlier, I caught up with Matt Layton to discuss maps, compasses and a sport that Switzerland is very, very good at. All right, Matt, orienteering was something I used to do when I was at school, but I understand there's even a European Championships. And it's a big event. It's going to be taking place in Ticino from the weekend, so the 5th, over the next six or seven days. And it's going to be really dynamic. It's the creme de la creme of Europe taking part. As we know, different distances. So you have the sprint, which is about 12 minutes, the medium, which takes about half an hour, and the long distance, which takes about 90 minutes. As you can see, well, what are they in orienteering? Lots of different versions. There's urban through the city. There's forest over the mountains. There's bicycle. There's all sorts of things. Essentially, you have to go on a planned route using a map, very detailed map, and a compass, stamping your to a little card in certain places. So the skill is to have an idea of where you're going, be very athletic, and to be able to navigate over often unknown and difficult terrain. That's what orienteering is, and it's very, very popular. And I imagine it's come a long way since I did it way back when, because it, for me, it was all about running through the rain, soggy maps, but I imagine technologically, it's a little bit more advanced these days. Yes and no. For the actual athletes, no. So they still have to go using a map and a compass. However, as opposed to doing a little hole stamp, which you and your pals at school probably did, now it's all done electrically. So that's different. However, the spectator experience, that's completely changed. They have a huge screen now and they can actually follow the athletes by GPS. So it's one of those sports that they're trying as much as possible to keep it pure and basic and keep it to the core skills, which is detailed map reading, navigation, endurance. And seeing as this is being held in Ticino, I'm imagining we're pretty good at this, Switzerland. 
I'd say better than pretty good, possibly the best nation in the world. There's in the men's, for example, you have Matthias Geibaz and Daniel Hoopman. They're number one and three in the world. Matthias, four-time world champion. There's, there's Matthias in the middle. On the right of your screen is Daniel. He's a seven-time world champion. And these guys have been at the top for the last seven or eight years. Also, in the women, there's a huge depth of field as well. So it's one of those sports that Switzerland, for some reason, well, there's about 10,000 people take part in, in this in Switzerland. It is mainly a sport which is popular in Ticino and the Swiss-German part. But again, uh, in Geneva and around there, they do have uh, uh, sort of fairly, very good standards. But yes, Switzerland, for some reason, I was asking the National uh, Secretary General, Martin Gagax, I said, why is Swiss so good? And he couldn't come up with an answer. I suppose it's a passion sport. There is a little bit of money in it if you are at the right at the top level, mainly through sponsorships. But yes, I don't, no one knows why, but the Swiss are extremely good and maybe the best team in the world. And tell me how this sport is developing in the future as well. You mentioned there's different kinds of orienteering. Yes, well, the International Organ uh, Orienteering Federation, they're traitors. Well, not really, but they're one of the few federations that are actually not based in Switzerland. They're actually based in Sweden. So come and join us, please. But yes, they're actually looking at the foot start. They're looking at the urban, as you can see in your picture. The urban, it's going to be their world championships in Denmark in 2020. What they're choosing there is they're going through, as the name suggests, town atmospheres, it's sprint but they're actually choosing old cities, so there's lots of intricate little roads there. There's also canoe, there's bicycle, there's ski, and there's lots of different ways you can actually go forward. So the main, I suppose, change in the future is they're trying to make it more popular with the masses. I suppose, like Biathlon did a few years ago, they've taken it out of going into the country and bring it more street cred. So yes, this urban is actually going to be a real, real, uh, I suppose, a breakthrough event when it actually, it's probably going to split in some way from the actual classic forest people. Because at the moment, a lot of the champions, the champions in the middle and the long and the short discipline, I think what we're going to see, according to the experts, in the next few years, is people are going to specialize. They're actually trying to go into the Olympics as well. Are they making success? Well, not yet. There's about 80 federations that get involved. However, they actually tried to get, they tried to get the bidding process for the, uh, the Tokyo Games. They tried to get as a reserve, as a demonstration sport for the, uh, the Paris Games. Not quite yet yet, but they do feel that in the future generations, they might make it to the Olympic Games, in the World Games at the moment. So we're big fans of orienteering. It's a clean sport. It's an outdoor sport. It's a popular sport. And it doesn't cost much money. So let's go orienteering, orienteering Switzerland, the best nation in the world. All right. Uh, Matt Leeson, thank you very much indeed, as always. Now, searching for the key to creativity, science are peering inside the brains of jazz musicians and other improvisational artists. So, could jazz improv certainly be the key to creativity? More on that in this CNN Health Minute. There's only one constant in jazz. It's always changing. As jazz musicians play, their brains create the ultimate freestyle improv. That's why science is peering inside, searching for the neural basis of our creativity. You see, jazz musicians spontaneously riff off each other, making it up as they go. What happens in their brains while they improv? Well, science is now using functional MRIs to find out. Neuroscientist Dr. Charles Lim found jazz players get into the flow by ramping up the part of the brain, shown in yellow, that allows humans to express themselves, while shutting down the area, shown in blue, that monitors and inhibits us. Recent research finds musicians who are mentally flexible and divergent, and who devote thousands of hours to practice, may access their creative flow more quickly. And it's not just all that jazz. Scientists are exploring the creative neural pathways in the brains of freestyle rap artists, classical musicians, comedians, caricature artists, while looking closely at the role of collaboration and emotion. Want to tap into your creative juices? Well, find something you enjoy and practice it without judgment. Then try to let go and feel the flow. All right, plenty still to come. Stay with us after the break. We're meeting the CEO of Fashwell, which is a Swiss startup that's been stateside to soak up some of that Silicon Valley magic.
welcome back to the programme. In tonight's edition of Tech Talk, we kick off a series on Swiss startups that have been to Silicon Valley earlier this year with the help of Venture Lab, a national startup training programme. And this week, we'll begin with image recognition company Fashwell. Martina Fuchs interviewed its CEO, Matthias D'Antoni, just before he flew to the United States. The Zurich-based startup Fashwell is the winner of several Kickstarter campaigns and startup challenges. It began as an app that automatically recognizes fashion products in images, made possible by an algorithm for image analysis based on machine learning. It was among the handful few to be selected to go to Silicon Valley this March for the Venture Leaders Technology 2018 summit and participate in an international investor roadshow. To talk about this, I'm now joined here in the studio by CEO and co-founder Matthias D'Antone. Matthias, first of all, Hi. tell me a little bit how this technology exactly works. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> what we're doing, it's relatively simple. So we try to teach the algorithm to see, we try to teach the computers to see, and, um, and especially um, not seeing in general, but really recognizing products. And um, the algorithm, uh, we have to train the algorithm really similar to a kid. We show it, for example, in, in this example of fashion, we show the algorithm several handbags in a color blue, several handbags in a color red, and just by reputation, it, it continuously learned to identify what are specific features of, an, of a handbag, and then um, the algorithm can apply this gained knowledge to like a new image, an unseen image. So in real life, how fast and accurate is this image recognition and analysis? Yeah. <clears throat> it's actually quite fast. Um, we, we got integrated into several consumer apps. Um, for example, we're powering the Zalando app. And with the Zalando app, you can take a picture of a handbag you like, and, and then in real time, in less than a second, you get a response, and then you can immediately buy that, um, that product. And Equus is a little bit different. We have to do two different steps. In the first step, we have to localize the product in the image. So we have to say, in this list coordinate, there is a handbag. Um, that usually is extremely fast, is extremely um, accurate. We have accuracy about 94% on that one. And then it's the recognition. For example, if it's um, a, a pretty unique and iconic shoe, a handbag, then we're pretty sure that we recognize that one. Um, but if you take a picture of an arbitrary blue jeans, then we obviously respond with similar looking blue jeans in the same style. Now you started as an app and <clears throat> then, as you mentioned, were integrated into Zalando. Uh, and now since 2017, you're also a uh, B2B business, basically. Um, how do you function and who are your customers? Yeah. <clears throat> we were extremely lucky to have Zalando as one of our first clients. But the technology we have is, um, is really generic and can be used uh, by anyone out there who needs image analysis with product information. Um, <clears throat> our typical clients are brands and retailers from the fashion industry. Um, so they're using us. And the other side, we are also working together with some of the biggest fashion magazines. Um, so we help them to make editorial content shoppable and so in order that they can actually make some money using uh, using the pictures they're putting online. Now, you were selected among a couple of uh, startup companies here in Switzerland uh, by Venture Lab to go to the Silicon Valley to participate in the Ventures um, Technology Summit 2018 and also a roadshow with international investors. What uh, are you hoping to achieve from that trip? Um, <clears throat> obviously, Silicon Valley is really special and I'm really glad that we got selected. Uh, it's a big honor for us. Um, and Silicon Valley, it's so unique. We're spending a lot of time there. It's so unique, there's like almost like no limitation there. And um, for us, it's important because since we are like expanding to the US, it's important for us to like meet clients. Um, but we're still a small Swiss-based company with big visions. Um, our vision is to replace the keyboard with the camera. And um, in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of people who are sharing our mission and sharing our vision, and um, the plan is really to meet all of them and uh, make the next step towards our goal of replacing the keyboard with the camera. 
you have mentioned a golden word, uh, which is expansion in the United States. Tell me about your international expansion mm. plans. Yeah, we actually uh, recently expanded. We recently opened up an office in, um, in, in, sorry, in New York City. Uh, first of March or second of March, we uh, opened up the office. Uh, we have at the moment one person there, but we're trying to um, expand a little bit there as well and uh, hire some people over there as well. So the fundraising environment uh, and also, you know, the funding in general for startups in Switzerland, I guess, is not very easy. How do you, you know, raise funds and uh, in which round are you already? Yeah. <clears throat> I think fundraising in Switzerland, you have to, first of all, divide biotech and IT. So I don't know anything about biotech, so just focus on IT. Um, and I think especially the angel round, so this friends and family um, um, it's relatively simple, actually, in Switzerland, especially if you come from ETH. ETH is helping a lot. There are a lot of wealthy uh, business angels here, and then you actually get that money. Uh, relatively simple, sometimes even too simple. Um, but then when it comes to like a decent seed round, uh, it becomes much, much harder for a Swiss company to raise since we don't have so many venture capitalists here. And then obviously continuing from seed round to series A round and series B round, it becomes harder and harder until you reach to the level where you're um, just an international company and then you raise the international anyway. And in uh, which round are you right now and how much capital are you <clears throat> hoping uh, to raise at the As moment? A, so for us, we would say we're like in scaling uh, round. So we have now um, the first really big clients, we're making a decent revenue and now it's really expansion. We proven that um, fashion is a really good market for us and now it's really expansion towards other verticals. We are already doing home and living now, but also then food and other um, verticals are interesting for us. Um, yeah, and obviously that costs, uh, expansion is expensive, so. We're and to which again. extent has the team up with uh, the online uh, fashion and e-commerce company Salando helped your business? Um, it was really important for us at the beginning, um, especially um, with three co-founders and in the industry, everyone was laughing a bit since what do these three geeks and the nerds know about fashion? And so it gave us a lot of reputation, um, but then really teaming up with them as a, um, as a client um, and also getting other big retailers, European retailers as first clients was really good for us. So we learned a lot from them. Um, and so we yeah, gained a lot of knowledge in the fashion space. Um, and we now really working together with them to bring this research to everyone's pocket. And as you are now expanding beyond the Swiss borders uh, to the United States as well, do you have any other partnerships uh, in the pipeline? Um, yeah, obviously, we, so we are working together with um, some of the biggest retailers in Europe. I would say we are already making about 40% of our revenue in the US. So we already have international clients. Um, so this is, the US is really important for us. And, at the beginning, since e-commerce is global and images don't have any don't have any language, so we are by default an international company. So. Now you, Matthias, have your PhD in image recognition and analysis, and you also worked at Google and uh, BMW, for example. How much has this international experience and you know work with multinationals helped you in launching this startup? I think that we took a lot of best practice from Google. Um, Google is well known as being one of the companies that put a lot of focus on, on engineering and engineering culture. And I think we took a lot of engineering practices from Google and adapted it to, for, for the startup world. Um, as an example, the way we are structuring our weeks and the way we're structuring our quarters is copied one by one from Google and we're just adapting it to and to the startup board. And I think that was extremely important for us to get a little bit more professional uh, on the engineering side. I'm always very interested in the incentive, you know, for someone to give up a career at, uh, you know, the likes of Google, for example, and launch your own startup. Was, what was your main motivation? Um, it's, that's actually an interesting question because um, on one side it was, um, I also see startups as a big career opportunity. And I think everyone now, especially also with all this um, hyper on startups, everyone knows that uh, startups can also be a huge career opportunity. Um, but in the end, I was also really driven by a personal goal. 
um, I'm collecting sneakers um, and I was like looking at sneakers online and didn't know how to describe them in words and so um, I just also solving one of my one of my passion problems which is like finding awesome sneakers online and that's where the fashion technology can actually help us. So let's take an everyday example. When you walk around the city of Zurich, do you have your mobile phone there and just you know scan people's mm. clothes and, and, and shoes? Mm. Or how do you walk around the city here? Switzerland is not such a fashionable city, <laughs> I must say. And uh, no, but um, I get inspired on, on social media, I get inspired online. And what I usually do is then I just quickly take a screenshot or something or use the picture I saw online and use that picture as a search query. And so in order to quickly step into the search results and really finding the shoe I was lacking. You just said that Switzerland is not a real big fashion market and scene. We have Mood Swiss, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the association that is trying to change that. How do you see the future of the fashion retail market here in Switzerland? <clears throat> fashion retail in Switzerland is, I would say, quite particular. Um, obviously, Switzerland has obviously the protectionism they have. It's um, yeah, it, it changed a bit. But we saw that we have Zalando as one of the definitely the most dominant player here. And then we have Amazon trying to come into Switzerland or doing the first moves into Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> but in the fashion space, we don't have a big, purely online player in Switzerland. Right? So we have the big brick and mortar stores um, that are still focusing a lot on offline and not really putting a lot of effort into online. Um, and I think that's also going to be an interesting time for the future. So what does Picard said, Globus and, and Co. do in the online space? And they still haven't really committed to, um, to the online space, but I hope that Fashwell can, can help some of them to really become a dominant player in the online space as well. With Amazon planning to enter the uh, Swiss market as well, I'm sure you must be talking uh, to them as well to maybe team up uh, with a partnership. <clears throat> We're talking to everyone. So we, our goal is really to change the way people are looking and searching for fashion products. And um, everywhere where people search, everywhere where people buy fashion products, they are perfect clients for us. So um, obviously we're talking to everyone who has an open ear. Sky is the limit. Now, you were also the winner of the uh, Swiss Startup Challenge, for mm -hmm. example, in 2016. How do these you know, competitions for startups actually help you to find a platform and a footing to kick off your career? <clears throat> I think it's important uh, for multiple reasons. One reason is this, this challenge is they bring the startup community closer together. Um, for example, in this, uh, we have been to San Francisco as well with 10 other founders. And um, out of these founders, we have now like really good, some of them became really good friends and they help, we're helping each other. And on the other side, I think it also brings a lot of awareness to the Swiss ecosystem for startups. And that's that there's a lot of um, benefits for everyone, especially for hiring. Now for um, good students from ETH, uh, the banks um, are not the only career opportunity they have. Now they're also seeing that some of the startups actually could be a potential career opportunity for them. And we're taking that also as, as a really good hiring instrument for us. So at the moment, uh, your headquarter is here in uh, Zurich, in uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Do you actually headhunt at the ETH and EPFL as well? Or how do you expand your office? Because at the moment, you just have about 16 people working for you here. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah for us, it's not. It's not, not only 16. So it's, for us, it's definitely um, quality over quantity. And we're spending a lot of time in hiring. We're pretty much participating in every hiring event they have at ETH or outside EPFL. So starting from startup speed dating, which is extremely helpful for us. And um, yes, we do hire um, at, um, at ETH, but also Switzerland is a pretty interesting um, spot for everyone to come here, and we also hiring international. Mm, we have 16 or 15, 15 employees at the moment, and as far as I can remember, we have like 10 nationalities. So we're hiring pretty much international. How do you see the startup, uh, you know, scene and community here in Switzerland? Uh, is it very difficult to, for example, lure Swiss people to join a startup because maybe in the conservative sense, you know, they still want to have a very stable job, work at a bank. Uh, that's why you have more international employees. 
that could be like one one thing. But um, I think also if you look at ETH, for example, they're doing their masters, there are a lot of international students, and I think um, this is just normally. So what we are looking for is students or you good young professional who really see the value of what we are bringing and see the value of working in a small startup and really trying. Um, <clears throat> we're looking for people who are really joining us into this, yeah, into the big startup path that we have and we really want to change the way people are searching for products. Before we go, in just one sentence, Matthias, if you have one, you know, dream, one wish, what would it be for your uh, startup company, Fashwell? Yeah, for us, <clears throat> we're in a mission to really be able to recognize every product um, in the world and we're living in an extremely visual world, but if it's online or offline, and for us, it's really, we want to make yeah, every product shoppable and every product viable, and really want to help our clients to make the best visual experience uh, and bring that to everyone's pocket. Well, that's it from me this evening, but stay with us. Newsmaker is next, and it's an exciting one. Jermaine Jackson is talking to Ana Maria Montero. The legendary Jackson 5 member on his love affair with Switzerland. Our newsmaker tonight is Jermaine Jackson, who talks to us about his music, on being a mentor, and how he first learned about Switzerland while at school in America. Growing up, going to elementary school and doing my history class, the teacher would pass out books and, on different countries and stuff, and I would turn to the pages in, in Switzerland, and I would stare at the pages, and this was way before the Jackson 5 days, yeah. and I would just kind of put myself into that page and and um, I always say one day I would get a chance to go. Big mergers and big deals. As markets react to the latest deal making, will it be enough to wake sleepy markets and bring out the bulls this week? Good evening, I'm Ana Maria Montero and you are watching The Newsmaker here on the Swiss Pulse. Let's get started. what time it is. It's time to look at those headlines making news here in Switzerland and around the world. Swiss online retailer Sidup is closing its doors. Owner Co-op made the announcement in a report today. Sidup, which was also launched with Swisscom, will cease trading by the end of the year. According to a spokesperson, no layoffs are planned. The 180 Sidup employees will be offered roles at other Co-op entities. France's Acor Hotels will buy Movenpick Hotels and Resorts for 560 million Swiss francs. Movenpick is one of Switzerland's most well-known brands in hotels and food. Its main markets today are in Europe and the Middle East, and the company plans to open 42 additional hotels by the year 2021. The deal is the latest step by Acor to diversify from budget hotels. Acor Hotels shares up are, are up by nearly 10% so far this year, outperforming a fall of around 5% on the stock's Europe 600 travel and leisure index. A closely watched leading indicator of the Swiss economy steadied in April after a bigger than anticipated decline in March. The cough economic barometer rose slightly, and although that indicator failed to reach the positive value seen at the start of the year, the current value was clearly above the long-term average. And in some Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May has named Saeed Yavid, a known Eurosceptic, as Home Secretary in an appointment that could tip the balance of power in the cabinet toward a harder Brexit. Yavid's predecessor, Amber Rudd, was a key pro-EU voice who often dealt a counterpoint to pro-Brexit hardliners. 
Javid, a former banker, has been clear on his stance that the UK should leave the customs union, which is currently a high point of contention in Brexit negotiations. On Wednesday, he will attend a key meeting of the Brexit War Cabinet, which will look at what kind of future relationship the UK will see with EU after the split. And the will they or won't they is over. Deutsches Telekom's T-Mobile and SoftBank Sprint have agreed to merge after years of negotiations. The combined company would take on T-Mobile's name, with T-Mobile CEO John Leger set to head the merged company. Sprint and T-Mobile first discussed the merger in 2014, but plans stalled because of concerns about regulatory challenges from the Obama administration. In the U.S., regulators in the Trump administration will have to sign off on the merger before it is final. And in a massive boost to the U.K. grocer, Sainsbury's plans to buy Walmart's Asda in a $10 billion deal. Sainsbury's stock surged to its highest level in 30 years. The combination of the two would create a supermarket power rivaling or even surpassing current market leader Tesco and could help it compete against Amazon. UK politicians, however, have called for an antitrust review, and there is still a significant risk that the deal will be blocked by regulators. All right, coming up after the weather, we hear from Jermaine Jackson on his love affair with Switzerland and growing up as part of the Jackson 5. Stay with us. Much more here to come on The Newsmaker. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland, and south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back. He started his career in the mid-1960s as a member of the iconic Jackson 5. 50 years on, Jermaine Jackson is still making music. But just as important to him is sharing his vast experience with younger generations of singers. Aside from mentoring his own children, he recently took part in Kids Voice Switzerland as a jury member and performer. And as he revealed to me, this is just one of a lifetime of trips that have brought him to the Alpine nation. Switzerland is very special. Um, I remember growing up in... Um, Growing up going to elementary school and doing my history class, the teacher would pass out books and on different countries and stuff, and I would turn to the pages in, in Switzerland, I would stare at the pages, and this was way before the Jackson 5 days, mm -hmm. and I would just kind of put myself into that page, and, and um, I always say one day I would get a chance to go because I love the snow. My birthday is December 11th, so it's during the snow snow winter time and I just love Switzerland so much once we became the Jackson 5 we got a chance to come and it's just beautiful you were and you were here during the winters right you were yeah oh oh many many times yes where somewhere in particular that stands out I've been to all over Davos St. Moritz Geneva okay, so all in the Engadine yeah, and, yeah, and Valle down Luzerne, to Bern, all, all over yeah then you are due for your red passport. Yeah, <laughs> You've probably yeah. seen more of it than many Swiss. Yeah, well, I, it's so funny. My family came here 
maybe 15 years ago, we had, it was on St. Patrick's Day, we had a big old thing of cheese made, and it was about this thick and this big around. i never forget that. And I think the cheese went to one of the brothers' houses, and we never got any, but it probably went to Jackie's house or, or someplace. <laughs> no, but it's, Switzerland's always been special because it's, it's clean, the mm -hmm. air is fresh, and mm -hmm. I love the, um, the sound of music, the movie, and just all, all, all of that has a lot to do with the whole feeling of being here. And it's really, over the years, it's also been kind of a safe haven for mm -hmm. celebrities and yeah, famous for, people. Yeah, for, yeah, to come here and also the banks, the banking is incredible, of, of, of course. But, but still? Yeah, you're right, because Phil Collins is uh, mm -hmm. here and I don't, he's a dear friend and yeah. there's a lot of... Tina still lives here, new, Tina Turner? New, yeah. Is still yeah. here, uh, Freddie Mercury, Mm -hmm. Chaplin. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we know the Chaplin family very well, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got a chance to visit their home, and I think it's in Vervey, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, wonderful pe people, just really nice. You know, something you should check out is a museum, the new Chaplin Museum. Oh, Have you seen it? I heard about it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's yeah. fantastic. Especially if you knew them, it's going to take on a whole different dimension, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I was part of, uh, I think it was Eugene Chaplin, the son. He had a, a film festival during the time, and mm. I would come over and help judge some of the films and stuff. Wow. So, yes, yeah, so you have a long love affair with Switzerland. Yes, I do. Yeah. And now you're here to do a specific job, which mm -hmm. is with our children, with our Kids Voice tour. Kids Voice. Tell me a little bit about your role. First of all, the Kids Voice is... is, is it's a great idea. My um, longtime friend, Paul Sutton, who's the boss uh, <laughs> and the producer, he, he told me about this a while back, but it's great to see it come alive now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's great when you give the kids an opportunity to show their talent and to mentor them. I'm sort of like a mentor and I'll be a judge. Mm -hmm. and, and um, that's how we started. We were just kids with a dream, and we were singing around the house, and my father said to my mother, Kate, they have some something, and he got behind us. He, he called her Kate. Her name is Catherine. Yeah. So he said, they got something. So he yeah. started buying amplifiers and guitars, and my mother would say, well, that was the money we were supposed to add on, <laughs> add on to the house and add another yeah. room for the kids, and he bought a, bought equipment. <laughs> and he came home with, with all this equipment. Paul loves his story. But he bought guitars and this and that. And the next thing you knew, we were singing and playing Motown stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he got behind us. So I think this type of show will at least get them out there mm -hmm. and to give them that inner confidence that they have something mm -hmm. that can evolve into something much bigger. I mean, my feeling when they told me you were going to be part of the of the final jury, you know, you're going to be part of the final judges that will select the winner, was, I mean, who better? I mean, you. <laughs> you know, and you know firsthand what it's like, exactly what you just said, to be mm -hmm. a child performer or a young person performing. Yeah, we were, see, with, with kids, it's very hard. You have to find the ones who are really focused because mm. during the time, I'll never forget, Michael wanted to be, he wanted to have a candy store, to tell the truth, and so he wanted to play store. My father said, um, you should really, uh, he had some gumballs, and he said, how, how much you bought those for you? He said, a penny, he said, so my dad said, how much you selling them for? He said, a penny, so my father said, stick to music, <laughs> so he's making no profit, right? But we all did that. We all, we all wanted to be ice cream men and the firemen and have stores, and then, but he saw something in us, and, and it was him that really got behind us and made it happen. And the flip side of that is, it's a lot of pressure to put kids under performing at such a young age, I feel like, but I wasn't a child performer, so I don't know. See, kids, kids believe in that they're very smart and they love to compete. Mm -hmm. they, you give them a game and they're going to see who can run the fastest, who can beat this one at a video game and this and that. So they're in that competitive mode anyway. But mm -hmm. to have a voice and to have something that is serious 
and um, they're never going to stop being kids, but at the same time, you're just giving them that platform to get it out there. Yeah, and it's a lot of work, right? That's a it's lot a lot of work. work. You have to be dedicated. See, we were, we still wanted to go outside and play, and okay. and uh, but my father said, uh, you have a show coming up, so you have to rehearse, yeah. rehearse, 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 yeah. rehearse. That's the key to being. It doesn't make perfect. They used to say, re, you, you rehearse, it makes perfect. It makes consistency, <laughs> where you can do the same thing over and over uh, again. And that's the key to, to rehearsing. Now, I heard um, on YouTube, I think, one of your children, Tafar, singing, wow, yeah. first of all. Thank you. And second of all, is this what you say to him now, too? Yeah, I, I try to be kind of, not tough, but I'm just telling him, like, to have aunts and uncles who have done what we've done, mm. it's not going to be, I always tell them there's no easy road to success. Mm. If you want it, you have to work hard at it. There's mm. no easy road. Just because your last name is Jackson, just because your, your uncles is this one and that one, and, and your aunts and Janet and this and that one, you got to work hard. Yeah. If you want it, you have to work hard. I mean, it's a good calling card anyway. Yeah. <laughs> People will take yeah. your calls. <laughs> yeah. but, but I tell yes. them to take that away and just look yeah. at yourself. And, mm somebody who's starting and who really wants it mm. and that's yeah so you make him work for it yeah yeah okay and um reality shows are actually not far out of your how do you say out of your bag of tricks and out of your experience you've had personal experience with reality shows no, my, my brothers, <laughs> you thought that show that we did. Well, I'm just, it goes way back. I guess, I guess where I'm going is that, you know, being a Jackson, you've kind of been living a reality show your whole life, no? No, you're right. You, you're right because you're in front of the camera 24-7. Yeah. And, and it's like you, you, we really don't notice the camera is there and, and, because it's been there so much. Mm -hmm. It's been part of our life. It's like putting on your shoes in the morning or getting dressed. That thing has been in my face all my life. And, and uh, it's, it's showing the public who you are. Mm -hmm. We felt that we were very blessed to have a great raising upbringing with my mother and father. So. There's nothing to hide. We're, we're just, we were kids with a dream and we had a father and, and mother, the love and the stability in the home. And then we, we got a chance to say our, make our say out there in, in the music world. Yeah. Did, were there any times where you were like, I'm, let's, let's, let's cut now, <laughs> you know, done with, could, can we turn no. off the camera, please? No, we couldn't wait to, well, the, the cameras sometimes, yes, but we couldn't wait to get on stage. Mm. We, we wanted to get up there and just go at it. Who's been your main, your main support through my all of this, through your whole life? My support has been my mother and father. And I say that in all sincerity because this business is really not a good business because you have people who want to exploit you. You have people who want to um, give you bad influence and, and this and that. And we always been people who have been in the business, but not of it, because there's a lot of bad things that go on in this, this mm -hmm. business. We're very fortunate to have had a mother and father who raised us the way we were raised, to know the difference, to know to stay away from this, to stay away from that. And it's just the simple thing of having respect. If you're going to have respect for your parents at home, you have respect for others, mm. and just just like when um, when when teachers when they have students and they come in there and they be very disrespectful to the class and to the teacher, that's because something's not going right at home, mm. and so it has to start at home first. But we've been very fortunate enough to have parents. Um, my father wasn't playing. I'm, I'm, I mean, you hear all these crazy stories about we got beating all that kind of stuff. No, that wasn't, mm -hmm. what, wasn't it. We were disciplined like kids because... Well, you were seven. Were, yeah. That's a lot of kids. There were seven <laughs> boys, and, and, and um, we, were, we grew up around the gangs and all that kind of stuff. My father didn't want us to get involved mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff, so he made sure he knew everywhere we were. And when the street lights came up, we had to be inside the house. So even more than music, you guys were kept together by your family. Yeah. What kept you together was those, yeah, those bonds. We, well, we, 
it's something about we had family before success, and mm. success comes and goes, but the family will always be there, I feel. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I'm also a firm believer in this. And, and I feel like, I mean, especially your family, you've been through so many ups and downs mm. and breakups mm -hmm. and reunions and, and hard times and good times, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and you've managed to stay, you know, the Jackson clan. Well, what it is is, is um, there is something about growing up in the Midwest or growing up mm -hmm. when you have a, f a family unit and you come out to Hollywood and, you know, Hollywood is Hollywood. All that glitters isn't glamour. It just looks good. But when you look past the, uh, the glitter, it's not what it's all su supposed mm -hmm. to be. Our whole thing was holding on to fam family, trying to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my father's main task. Mm -hmm. So we, we, uh, we've been through a lot, but we've been a able to deal with it because of the strength and the nucleus of the family. Like, it is very hard to get us all in a place at the same time because so many different mm -hmm. individual schedules and this and that because... There's so many of you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, but... Um, we we have a thing called family day where we come together but still there's still not everybody there there's so many now but yeah kids and grandkids and you know yeah, there's one nephews. being born right now all the time oh. <laughs> <laughs> all the time yeah. all the time the yeah. the family the family is growing there's one in the oven somewhere yeah yeah and in the second part of our interview with Jermaine Jackson the singer talks touchingly about the loss of his brother Michael and the impact this has had on his life. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Newsmaker and the second part of our interview with Jermaine Jackson, a member of the legendary Jackson Five and of what ultimately became known as the Royal Family of Pop. Jackson recently traveled to Swiss Romand, where he served as a member of the jury for Kids Voice Switzerland and performed two songs. Now, one was Charlie Chaplin's Smile, his brother Michael's favorite song, and the other one is one I'm sure you've all heard before. Recorded on August the 28th, 1970 at Motown Records, I'll Be There. I'll, I'll Be There has been a great song for the Jackson Five because there's probably one of the number one songs that really transitioned the Jackson Five from doing, as they said, bubblegum music during that time to more serious music. Because we had I Want You Back, ABC, Stop Your Levy, Say, Then I'll Be There. All those were number one records. Mm -hmm. But I'll Be There was more like a more serious type, type of song. And mm -hmm. so that showed people that we weren't just kids, but we can transcend into an older crowd, and that, that was that song that was the breaking point, I think. You know, I guess it's going on, what, 10 years mm. since uh, Michael passed. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, how did, standing here today, sitting here today, what is that, what are your thoughts? It's hard. Yeah. It's hard, there's not a day that goes by that, mm. that, that I don't think of him, there's not a day that goes by that you don't hear his music, and. Well, that's for sure and to share so many, like, the years before the Jackson Five, us just around the house and us just singing in the room before we even became the Jack Jackson Five. We were in triple bunk beds and then, and then our dreams coming true and, and, um, and then having a tragic end like, like that. It's like, I'll never un understand. Yeah. I don't understand why and where, where is he and why I know with all the good things that he's done, he's, he's, he's with God, but his death is very hard to lose someone. It's very hard, especially when someone has been in your life all of your life and, and then has made an Im impact on his music. I feel that putting aside the entertainer, Michael, the, the dancer, and this and that, I think the world really cried because they knew where what his heart was. Mm -hmm. he, he was trying to bring the world together through songs and video and bringing an awareness to the problems 
of the world. And I think that's why God blessed him with so much talent because he knew it wasn't about buying houses and cars and jewelry. It was taking that blessing and giving back to people to inspire pe people. Mm -hmm. That's Michael Jackson. That's, that's absolutely what he did. Mm -hmm. I know, and they, like you said, the world lost an, an icon, but you lost a, a brother, right. you know? Like, yeah. I, can't, I, have two, I have three of them. I can't imagine going there, you know? It's hard. So, it's hard, I imagine. That's not, not something is, that gets easy. It is really yeah. hard, but he's, um, he's in our hearts and, and all the time. Like on stage, we do kind of like a, a tribute, like a chance to sing mm -hmm. some of his songs, which I like his, his songs too. Um, and uh, I do Gone Too Soon, and it's very mm. emotional at, at times. It was so hard, because when we first started rehearsing after my brother passed, mm. I cried so much. I wore my glasses, and I just, because I'm so used to being on stage, and he's right here mm. on my right. And um, it was just tough, very, very tough. And still to this day on certain songs, like, like if I'm playing the bass, I'll move back because I know he's going to shoot out this way. Your body's been programmed to do that. And, and um, then he's over here and, and there, and we're just doing our thing. But we, we miss him a lot. Smile was, uh, wow, that was tough to, to tell you about that. My mother, I told my mother I, I, I wanted to sing a song for Michael for the, for the, for the, uh, for the memorial. And she said, Honey, whatever you want to do for your brother, do it now. And so I sung Smile. And, uh, and it's so funny be because I used to come over to Vivay, Switzerland, to visit the chaplains. The chaplains, family, yeah. And he didn't know that I knew them, and I didn't know that he knew them. So one day I show up, and he's there. And I <laughs> no said, way, in yes, the chaplains? I, yes. So I said, what are you doing here? And he said, what are you doing here? And so I said, I know Michael, and he said, I know Eugene, because these are the two brothers, right? And, and uh, so we were just laughing and stuff. But that's happened many times. Even when we went to visit Mandela, I was there, and he was there. And I didn't know he was coming, and he didn't know I, I, I was coming. But fun. no, it's um, singing Smile, because Charlie Chaplin wrote it. Mm -hmm. And that was one of Michael's favorite songs. And uh, that's why I sung it, and it was it was very tough for me to sing. I've never, like, there was just a, a load on my chest because that was that moment of just singing to him. And I never forget, I took the rose off my, off my uh, jacket and I threw it and it landed right on the top of his coffin. It was just. Um, I also read somewhere recently where you said, referring to your niece Paris, that you know, she has to, and all of your nieces and nephews and your children, they all have to contend with being, with living with the Jackson legacy. It's a part of their, their being. They have to always, mm -hmm. there's always this point of reference um, for them. So what is it like to be a Jackson? See, we've been under the microscope for so many years, and if we do anything, it's going to be viewed as, Good or bad. There's or, always judgment. Or some yeah, judgment. I was saying by that point is I feel that we um, kids like I'm a little more lenient on my kids than what my father was with us. So they get a little more breathing room. But I'm saying this to say that me, Tito, Jackie, Marlon, Michael, Rebe, Latoya, mm -hmm. and Janet we feel we upheld the integrity of the Jackson family. If there's a second generation that's going to come out there. You can't be acting a fool. You can't be embarrassing. you got to be your, you have our DNA, so mm -hmm. the, you can't be disrespectful to people. You can't mm -hmm. get involved with certain things and, and that aren't good. So um, I'm watching, <laughs> and we're watching yeah. all the time, yeah. Because we worked too hard to, it wasn't easy. It was blood, sweat, and tears, and, 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 and a hard road. But at the same time, when you're accepted, it's easy to be nice. It's harder to be ugly, I feel. It's easy to be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes honest is perceived mm -hmm. as ugly. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just mm -hmm. being straight. 
Yeah, well, well, see, you have, which, which you know, there's, there's a lot of propaganda and in, and in the media, mm -hmm. nothing positive sells. It's the negativity that they want to exploit and say, oh, did you hear so and so mm -hmm. and so and so? And there go the magazines and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the papers. There is a such thing as good news. News is good news too. Yes, there's a place for it. Yeah, that's what's needed. More of that and more family consciousness mm -hmm. too. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the music business then. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've going on 50 years since the Jackson 5, <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Such a career, I mean, such a legacy. What do you make of digitalization in music? Do you feel like it's really been a good thing or do you long for the days of Motown where you can go into the studio and just record and make your LP? And <laughs> you know, it's all a creative yeah. process. And I think people are getting lazier because labor is everything, the blood, sweat and tears when you can touch and feel and you're playing in real mu musicianship. There's nothing wrong with the digital side of it because these are creative people making products and, and, and doing things, but it's just something about real musicianship mm -hmm. and the warmth. Even a digital microphone as, as compared to a tube mic. A tube mic, mm -hmm. and Paul and I were just talking about this, a U87, which is warm. Like he was playing a song that, and I did, and he used a U87. Mm -hmm. and it made my voice very warm. When I have a digital mic, it's just too contrived. It's yeah. not real. So with the music today, like you have, you push a button and it plays. Mm -hmm. And the... The song is just like perfect tempo, everything. Everything's perfect. Right, but it was something about when you start a song mm -hmm. and you with musicians like Barry White and Stevie Wonder and some of the funk brothers from the Motown days mm -hmm. and you start a song off of one tempo and by the end of that song, it's raised a few beats per measure because they're going home, they're, they're vamping and you're feeling them, them just giving their all right. and you don't have that in music today, the dynamics. Mm -hmm. That's what you don't have and that's what's missing. It starts off one way and it ends the same way, but it goes nowhere and that's what's missing. Is there any turning back though? Well, I think yes, because there are a lot of bands who are recording live today with the real musicianship. I think Bruno Mars is one and we do and and um, bringing back a lot of that old feeling too is, is, is really important. And are you in the midst of creating some new music? Or are you always creating new music? <laughs> We're always writing, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm more like that. I'm doing the Joe Jackson role with my two sons, Jafar and Your Majesty. Coach, oh, really, three, Jermaine Jr., he's singing. And my, my, okay. my daughter, Autumn, she, she sings, but she's more of a business woman. But then she wants to sing one day, and then she wants to do business. But um, I find myself just mentoring them and talking to them and, mm -hmm. and sort of giving them the ropes of, and now my father says, now you see what I went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I really see now. Yeah. All right, so just to finish up, I've got a question out of a hat. I just ask you to pull out one of these guys, read it out loud, and just give me your first thoughts. What is the best purchase you've ever made? This is CNN money. <laughs> best purchase, wow. That's a tough one. Mm. Um, probably one of the best. Some equipment for okay. the kids. Okay. A keyboard for Jafar and Your Majesty. Okay. Yeah. That'll do. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Much more to come here on The Newsmaker tonight. As the deadline looms for an exemption from U.S. tariffs for the European Union, we look at the chances for a potential deal and ripple effects for us here in Switzerland. Stay with us.
It's an interesting week ahead, including the wait for U.S. President Donald Trump's decision on trade tariffs for Europe, as well as the announcement of the U.S. Federal Reserve's monetary policy. Now, earlier, I spoke to Norman Villeman, Chief Investment Officer, UBP Private Banking, to talk about what these key decisions could mean for Swiss and global markets. Well, I think this is the announcement on what I'll call the first round of tariffs, so steel and, steel and aluminum, uh, that were announced uh, in early February. Um, we think the markets have adjusted to that. We saw the market sell off in uh, February, haven't rebounded very much. We think that's in the market. What is not in the market is an expansion of that tariff and the, that trade conflict that has been brewing. And we don't think that is necessarily a worry in the near term. Okay, so that's the markets. Now, what do you, what, so we're looking to see if Europe will still be exempt from tomorrow's announcement. We're looking to see if they'll still be exempt from the new export tariffs. Do you believe they will be? I expect they will be, uh, largely because if you look at the second round of the tariff conflict, it was clear it was very focused on China in terms of where the exemptions were and China as a direct target of uh, the, the moves by the United States. So I think we're going to see the next rounds to be very, very China-focused and really trying to reset that relationship between those two large countries. So you think that the Eurozone can breathe easy? I think they can breathe easy for now, but what does appear to be clear is that the United States would like to effectively reset the trade frameworks that have been in place since WTO and look for a new framework that perhaps, in their view, is a little less imbalanced uh, against them. All right, so that's, that's good news even for us here in Switzerland, no? In the, in the near in term, the near I think term. that's good news, but what it does do... Good news do, for Germany is good news for us here. <laughs> that's true. Um, but I think what it does do, it, it creates this, uh, this uh, small piece of uncertainty, which Mark is going to have to price going forward. Mm. And uncertainty is never good for investors. No, that's right. What, what uncertainty, referring to what you said before about the markets? Or? Uh, the uncertainty going forward is, what are the next steps? Again, I think we need to realize, for example, there's a new uh, government likely to take uh, uh, power in Mexico in July. Okay. Um, that will bring the NAFTA discussion back to the forefront uh, for North America. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, in November, uh, the uh, Republicans will have to defend their majorities in both the House and the Senate. And that will be an opportunity, if you like, for Donald Trump and the Republicans to push harder on this trade front um, and their America First policies. And that may create some instability as well. I can imagine. Now, if we stay with stateside news, then we've got the Fed meeting coming up this week. Mm -hmm. And um, what could this possible trade tariff decision mean for the Fed? Well, look, I, th I think there is concern, and they've highlighted, the Fed has highlighted that if you get in, in uh, imbalances on the trade front, uh, that could affect the growth outlook that the Fed is uh, looking at uh, in terms of how they're setting policy. But in the near term, we don't think there's any changes to that growth outlook. Growth in the first quarter actually came in above what a lot of people were worried about. They thought it was going to be closer down towards two. Inflation is coming up as expected. And so we think the Fed will stay on track um, and signal a rate hike in the June meeting uh, coming forward. Could there be? So we, there are three rate hikes expected, right, this year? We, we believe there's three more. So we had, obviously, the March move. We think they'll come in June, September, and then again in December. Okay, so we could look at, could we see four? Well, the market is increasingly pricing four, um, and we think that is probably about right. That gets us, from a real interest rate perspective, adjusting for inflation, mm -hmm. uh, real interest rates in the United States back to above zero for the first time really since the crisis. Um, and we think that's where the Fed would like to be. And if we look at last week, also the bond yields, yes. were the rates went up over 3%. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does this mean for monetary policy and what the Fed might be saying? I think the Fed is quite interested to see how these bond yields are going to affect the, uh, affect the growth story going forward in the U.S. Again, the first quarter growth was quite good. We expect growth in the subsequent quarters to stabilize here, not a lot more acceleration, mm -hmm. even though bond yields are at 3%. If that's the case, then I think the Fed will be comfortable that its policies are on the right track. Uh, if not, then bond yields probably come off from here. And the overall Fed meeting effects on the markets? Um, for us, we think as long as they're guiding towards continued rate hikes, again, in the June meeting mm -hmm. and in the second half of the year, that keeps the markets on track in terms of where expectations are uh, from here. 
And as a result, I think the markets will then continue to focus on the earnings picture, which have been quite good. Mm-hmm. And you'll see uh, them trying to scrape back uh, from what had been a difficult first quarter of the year. Okay. Now, if we bring it back now to Europe, mm-hmm. um, in, Euro- the Euro- in the Eurozone in general, inflation is lower. Yes. So should we continue not to worry? Or? Um, we should, if you like, we, we should still be comfortable in the Eurozone for a couple of reasons. One, at a much earlier stage of the recovery than, for example, the United States. Secondly, one of the reasons why inflation has been quite low is the Euro, and admittedly even the Swiss franc until fairly recently, had been quite strong. And again, uh, until recently, commodity prices had been relatively low. Mm. What we've seen over the last six weeks or so the euro, the Swiss franc, um, has have started to weaken. Mm. And on the flip side of that, commodity prices have started to rise. So you should start to see inflationary pressures building both in the eurozone and in Switzerland over the coming quarters. And what would this, yeah. What, what about the gap between U.S. and the German treasury yields? Now, these are bigger than they have been since the beginning of the century. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so almost 19 years. Do you feel like this will pressure the ECB to make a decision faster? Well, I think if I'm the ECB, one of the things I'm disappointed in Mm. is in spite of the gap, the euro has been quite strong. Um, And as a result, inflation is quite low. And so if they start to see uh, the euro weakening, they will probably be happy with that gap, meaning their policies are moving in the right direction from here. So I don't think they're all too uh, concerned about how wide that gap is, as long as it means that uh, their policy uh, initiatives are taking hold within the, the eurozone economy. Okay, and if we zoom in to Switzerland now, in Switzerland here we're caught between very positive growth because mm-hmm. it's above the, potent, the, the potential, it's moving at a faster rate, and, but the SNB cannot really do much. Is this correct? They can't really do much uh, from the standpoint that obviously they're, they are constrained a little bit by what the ECB is going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they can do, and this is what we think they're doing, is we do think that they are willing to let the Swiss economy run a bit hot from here. Inflation remains below target. The Swiss economy is looking very good, but there aren't imbalances. There aren't uh, instability within the economy, uh, a hot property market, speculation moving through the economy, high amounts of leverage. Mm-hmm. And so from that perspective, given that even at 120 on the Euro-Swiss franc exchange mm-hmm. rate, we're right back where we started before they removed the floor. Yeah. I would probably expect yeah. them to allow the economy to run hotter, the Swiss franc to be a bit weaker, uh, to get them a bit closer to target. Now, Norman, you're unbelievably positive <laughs> about everything that I've asked you. Is there anything negative that could happen that could cast a shadow uh, in the short term? Well, uh, I, we, are, we are positive and we are constructive, but we do think 2018 is going to be a more challenging year than 2017, mainly because of where valuations are. Um, And why is that important today? And it wasn't important last year. The main reason for that is, is we believe the accelerating growth that we've seen over the last 12 months is starting to peak out. And historically, when that's happened, valuation peaks out. And so we're going to lean more heavily on earnings, which, as we've seen, have been a bit bit more mixed um, in this earnings season. And what does this mean for, for investors? I think when we look for investors, again, last year was a year where, for the most part, you just waited and the market went up. This year, it's going to be much more challenging. You're going to see this kind of volatility, and you're going to have to pick your spots. We think active management, active investors are going to be much more rewarded this year than last year, where a passive strategy uh, was an adequate way to participate in the markets. Cars teaching themselves to park. Drones learning to follow humans. All this inside a Bondesk lab in a picturesque town in Switzerland where scientist Jürgen Schmidhuber works toward an AI revolution. Artificial intelligence is what makes Siri respond to your commands, enables Google to translate, and helps Facebook find your face in a crowd. But critics fear there's a far more sinister side. CNN's Erin McLaughlin has the story. In the picturesque Swiss town of Lugano, Scientist Jürgen Schmidhuber works toward revolution. If he's successful, the world will never be the same. All of this is going to be much more than just another industrial revolution. This is going to be something that transcends humankind itself, and even biology itself. 
Schmidhuber is an AI pioneer. His goal? To create artificial intelligence radically smarter than humans. He's helped develop the algorithms that define the field as we know it now. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is what makes Siri respond to your commands. Here is what I found. And enables Google to translate. What do we have here? This is a Inside Schmidhuber's labs, AI pushes beyond that. Cars teach themselves to park. When you now move your head, then it is going to follow, and you can direct it. Drones learn to follow humans. I go forward, I go backward. AI even teaches itself to run. The important thing is there's no teacher. And what you see there, it's trying all kinds of things. And in the beginning, it's a total failure. And the goal is just to maximize the distance covered. The next step, developing robots which can teach themselves to perform simple tasks. Still, none of this comes close to super intelligence. These are mobile platforms. Schmidhuber believes it can be achieved in mere decades. So there are those who are skeptical who say that actually AI could very well enter another sort of deep freeze period where nothing happens. At the moment, I don't see that as a possibility at all because all the tendencies that I observe in my own lab, in other labs, the general hardware acceleration, tell me another story. Other leaders in the field agree. Nick Bostrom is the director of the Future Humanity Institute at Oxford University. I think it will affect all aspects of our lives, all segments of the economy. He worries not enough is being done to prepare for the potential dangers. Given your research, given everything you know so far, are you optimistic about the future of humanity? I think this transition to the machine superintelligence era will be associated with some significant risk, in including these existential risks of, of human extinction and such. But um, on the other side, and, and this often get, doesn't get as much sort of airtime, but I think there is this enormous upside. Schmidhuber says he's confident the enormous upside will prevail, but he admits it's like playing with fire. We have to be aware of the potential dangers of fire, but we are not going to stop the further development of fire because the pros outweigh the cons so much. It may be unpredictable, but Schmidhuber and others agree. When it comes to AI, the match has been struck. Aaron McLaughlin, CNN, Lugano, Switzerland. Searching for the key to creativity, scientists are peering inside the brains of jazz musicians and other improvisational artists. So, could jazz improv be the key to creativity? More on that in the CNN Health Minute. There's only one constant in jazz. It's always changing. As jazz musicians play, their brains create the ultimate freestyle improv. That's why science is peering inside, searching for the neural basis of our creativity. You see, jazz musicians spontaneously riff off each other, making it up as they go. What happens in their brains while they improv? Well, science is now using functional MRIs to find out. Neuroscientist Dr. Charles Lim found jazz players get into the flow by ramping up the part of the brain, shown in yellow, that allows humans to express themselves, while shutting down the area, shown in blue, that monitors and inhibits us. Recent research finds musicians who are mentally flexible and divergent, and who devote thousands of hours to practice, may access their creative flow more quickly. And it's not just all that jazz. Scientists are exploring the creative neural pathways in the brains of freestyle rap artists, classical musicians, comedians, caricature artists, while looking closely at the role of collaboration and emotion. Want to tap into your creative juices? Well, find something you enjoy and practice it without judgment. Then try to let go and feel the flow. Bringing you a bit of Hollywood now where a certain Marvel movie's massive debut is prompting a lot of reactions. CNN's David Daniel has that in the Hollywood Minute. We have what Thanos wants. 
So that's what we use. The record-setting Avengers Infinity War includes dozens of comic book heroes, though not Deadpool, of course. Not that he didn't try. To celebrate the Marvel movie's record-setting debut, Ryan Reynolds, who plays Deadpool, tweeted out the character's coffee-stained rejection letter from Tony Stark, denying Deadpool's request to join the Avengers back in 2012. Reynolds' comment, from a guy who never knows when to quit, I'm glad you guys never did. Congrats, Avengers. Deadpool 2 opens May 18th, with Infinity War villain Josh Brolin crossing over to play Deadpool's new nemesis, Cable. I think it's good, except it sucks, so let me do the plan, and that way it might be really good. The popularity of Infinity War appears to have prompted a change by the film subscription service MoviePass. Members can see a movie every day for a monthly or annual fee, but according to The Hollywood Reporter, MoviePass now prohibits repeat viewings of the same movie. The company's CEO tells the magazine it's to keep users from turning their memberships into a cottage industry by selling their tickets. Members who want to see Infinity War again will just have to fork over like everybody else, and we mean everybody. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. And that's it from us here on The Newsmaker and also The Swiss Pulse. Don't forget, you can also watch us on our CNN Money website, cnnmoney.ch. You can catch up with all our not-to-be-missed stories and interviews. I'm Ana Maria Montero. Thank you so much for watching this evening and have a wonderful night. CNN Money Switzerland Business Weather, starting with Europe. Next step, Africa and the Middle East. Southeast Asia. And now Australia and Oceania. Let's go to North America. We end our trip with off America. CNN Money Switzerland accompanies you all over the world.